And this is the meeting of the Cohasset Planning Board. Uh, thank you for all who are in attendance when we had a problem with connectivity. And we are going to be continuing our meeting, um, which was disturbed by uh, electrical storms. Uh, let me get, begin by uh, making a few introductory comments. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the planning board members, <clears throat> Clark Brewer, Tom Callahan, Paul Grady, Paul Colleri, and Eric Potter. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the colleagues I work with in town, Lauren Lind, who is the Director of Planning, and uh, Jennifer Oram, who is the uh, Assistant Director for Planning, Permits, and Building Inspections. And they will be working with you if you are here as a member of the public or as a presenter, and uh, if you have any difficulties in accessing me the meeting, please contact them uh, as they can give you some instructions on how to get into the meeting. Uh, during the last Conservation Commission meeting, there were some difficulties in the public getting involved. So if you can't get access, send me an email, send Lauren Lind an email or Jen Orm an email and between the three of us, we will make sure that everybody has access to the conversation. We have two major items for discussion tonight. <clears throat> um, uh, the first will be a continuing discussion of uh, Jerusalem 580. And I will have uh, Lauren in a minute describe what that will be about. And then the second is one of several uh, discussions and information sessions that the board is uh, engaging with regard to the Harbor Village overlay plan that we are currently discussing. With that, uh, Lauren, please adjust anything I haven't said and let's begin. Just oh, need to uh, open, uh, if we just need to open the meeting officially and do a roll call vote. All right. Um, so, uh, I was going to punt that to Lauren. Well, thank you. So then uh, we'll entertain a roll call vote, um, starting with uh, the Madam Chair. Amy Glassmeyer. Clark Brewer. Clark Brewer. Here. Tom Callahan. Here. Paul Cleary. Paul Cleary here. Eric Potter. Here. And we do not have Paul Grady with us at this time. All right, thank you. So our first order of business tonight is a continued public hearing for the large house plan review of 580 Jerusalem Road. Continued from October 7th. Um, just to give a background as to where, how we got to where we are tonight. This, I gave an overview at the opening night of this public hearing that this is a retroactive large house plan review. Um, we went over in some extent last meeting about you know, there were some mistakes made on both sides of our building department as well as on the applicant. Now our plan uh, for tonight is to move forward with allowing the applicant to present their large house plan review. And we will turn it over um, in a moment after we hear from our large house uh, plan review applicant team. We will hear from the peer reviewers that have been involved. We had um, Amory Engineer previously as a peer reviewer involved. And since that last meeting, we have had uh, Grady Consulting as an, as an additional engineer to provide additional information that was alluded to at the last continuance of this hearing. So um, with, without further ado, I'm going to promote the panelists here who are here to speak for this application. We have attorney Chris Greeley representing the applicant. We have um, Jan Hansel is the applicant and represented by his real estate agent, Roxanne Meller. I'll promote them right now. I believe that is everyone we have right now for the applicant team. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm mistaken. We have uh, representatives from Sousa Design Architects, who is the architecture <laughs> firm here as well. Thank you. Okay. Lauren, I think Eric's phone might still be unmuted, just FYI. Um, can I share my screen? Or? I can see you, Stephen. Yeah, can, can, can you see? 
Can I share my screen? Yeah, let me try to share yes. my screen here so we could go through it. <clears throat> okay, so this is the house at 580 uh, uh, Jerusalem Road. Uh, oh. It was designed as a shingle style Gambrel house. And I'll take you through the drawings uh, that we have now. Uh, This is the existing survey uh, from Hoyt Land Surveys that we had. And the next drawing is our civil plan that shows uh, how we plan to, plan to manage the water runoff of the building. Uh, we plan to fill the uh, front yard so we could take the inputting in infiltration system in the front with the Cultec. and one in the rear as well to manage the gutter flow, the rainwater coming uh, off the structure. This is a locust map of Jerusalem Road and where the site is located, 580 Jerusalem Road. And this is a 300 foot radius of the houses that we uh, looked at to show uh, the neighborhood context. I think I went through these uh, last time as well, but the first uh, house is 597 Jerusalem Road. The gross floor, it's on 0.1975 acres. The gross floor area is 5436. It's a two-story building plus attic. The FAR is 0.63. The second one is 579 Jerusalem Road. It's on 0.586 of an acre. The gross floor area is 3730, and it's a 0.15 FAR. Uh, 575 Jerusalem Road has a land area of 0.77 of an acre. It's uh, 4,918 square feet, and it's a 0.15 FAR. Uh, the condo building across the street, 589 Jerusalem Road, it's on 1.25 of an acre. Gross, gross area is 13,500 square feet. It's 10,000 square feet of an FAR of 0.25. And 577 Jerusalem Road, it's 0.67 of an acre. It's an FAR of 0.14. Uh, it's, uh, you know, custom cape wood shingle. Um, in 573 Jerusalem Road, a land area of 1.36 of an acre. It's a gross area of 5265 square feet, and it's a 0.9 FAR. Uh, 572 Jerusalem Road is 0.853 of an acre. Gross floor area is 4,932 square feet, FAR of 0.13. It's a Gambrel wood shingles. Uh, again, with eight, block, eight Black Rock Road, it's 0.25 of an acre. This house is directly behind us. It's 4,940 square feet, and the FAR is 0.44. Uh, 15 Black Rock Road, uh, it's 0.80 of an acre. Gross, gross uh, area is 4,428 square feet and it's a 0.12 uh, FAR. It's a farmhouse with clapboards. Um, 560 Jerusalem Road has a land area of 0.48. Gross floor area is 4639. It's a Victorian shingle style building, wood shingles on the exterior and it's an FAR of 0.22. Uh, 18 Black Rock Road has a land area of 0.14. It's a gross floor area of 3,722 square feet. And it has a, it's a colonial sort of with vinyl siding. Um, and it's a FAR of 0.58. And 29 Black Rock Road is 
a land area of 1.14 acre. It's a gross floor area of 6,912 square feet. And it's in a finished area of 4,630. It's a colonial sort of a clapboard exterior wall. And it has an FAR of 0.13. Um, uh, excuse me, I'd like to ask Mr. D'Souza, could you explain for the public uh, the, the meaning of the relationships between the numbers that you're describing? I think it would be very helpful for people to understand not only the visual context, but actually what the numerical context means. Right, so land area is the size of the lot based upon an acre, right? The gross floor area is the size of the house. The finished area is the finished livable square footage of the house. And the FAR is taking the gross area divided by the lot size. Thank you. So what we're proposing, we have a 24,000 square foot, 298 square foot lot. Uh, we're pro pro proposing a finished area of 5,387 square feet for an FAR of uh, 0.22. And I'll bring you on to the site for the plan. So this is a site plan of, the, um, of our proposed uh, house. We have a driveway element here. As we talked about, we're doing an infiltration system in the front yard that we're raising the grade at the street with a, in capturing that in a retaining wall and creating a plinth that the house sits upon and filling in uh, the grade from 27 so to 30 uh, so that infiltration system can be accommodated. You, we're using a... Uh, uh, a Weymouth uh, retaining wall uh, stone that we plan to use uh, um, quarry locally and build a, uh, a retaining a loose laid retaining wall of that. We're doing landscaping at the perimeter um, on each side, and those landscaping uh, pieces are boxwood shrubs at this piece in this piece around here as well as leading through the pathway a bluestone pathway coming up uh, the entrance to the house and a bluestone steps that lead to the uh, porch area we're doing a landscape buffer from the pathway to the house on each side we have some landscape lighting that lights up those pieces of uh, uh, shrubbery that leads to the uh, house. We have recessed cans inside the porch area and we have two decorative fixtures um, uh, on each side of the entry. You can see here, there's a better shot of what we're trying to do. So uh, the plants, what we're, what we're proposing for plants is some seed hollies that line the, the pathway, some green velvet boxwoods that line the retaining wall on each side of the driveway. We're doing some myrtle uh, brown cover uh, that comes across uh, uh, on, on the planting beds. And you can see we're doing a Kitchler dome light uh, for landscape lighting as not to cause any light pollution, but just to highlight the shrubs as you go into the house. We're doing a Troy exterior sconce on the front. Uh, when we get on the back of the house, we have an exterior sconce, again, uh, 
dark sky compliant that's going to light the, the back deck. Uh, we have a blue stone walkway and that's a graphic of the retaining wall. Excuse me, Mr. Souza, there, there aren't any spotlights or anything like that? There isn't, no. Just accent lighting and? Just accent lighting and sconces on the building, yes. Okay. Okay, so then the next. So these are the floor plans of the existing house showing the actual square foot of the house. Uh, the front, uh, the first floor plan has a garage entry, mud room, family room, dining room and living room. And the upstairs has uh, five bedrooms. Mr. D'Souza, from the standpoint of the the public watching, is the building footprint reversed? Uh, the garage is on which side of the building, which side of the road to, relative to uh, Black Rock? The garage is on the right-hand side. Right, the garage. Facing, so when somebody's looking at this, it's facing the house, it will be on the right side. That's correct, yes. Thank you. So the first floor is 21, uh, 2137 square feet. The second floor is uh, 2667 and the attic, which is finished is 583 square feet. So we, we've got a cathedral ceiling, but there is a little balcony that uh, uh, looks upon the water and there's a little living space uh, uh, under the eaves space in the attic. You know, we've done, um, part of this is we've done some shadow studies. So we've looked at the uh, three basic pieces of summer, winter, and sp spring solstice at 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 3 p.m. As you can see, this is our site at 580 Jerusalem Road. This is 8 Black Rock Road, 29 Black Road, and 672 Black Rock Road. So you, uh, you could see what effect the new structure has on the neighbors and it doesn't appear to be casting any shadows or creating any shadows for the direct abutters. There is on spring, there's a little shadow cast on this piece, but that seems to be it in fall, a little shadow is cast. Uh, this is just showing the construction uh, basement plan. The first floor construction plan. Again, we went over this, a three car garage on the right. You come in through a mud room. You have an exterior porch. Um, you have a deck off the back and a screen porch to the left. This is the second floor, again, five bedrooms. The master bedroom, which is over the garage, has a deck that looks out over the water. We have a sitting room and those pieces. And that's the attic plan. Uh, these are the elevations of the house. Again, we, we spent a lot of time designing this house. <clears throat> we studied the shingle style. We, shut, we studied a couple precedents, in Newton and Brookline, how that gambrel uh, was interpreted in the shingle style. And that's kind of how we based the design of the house. We, it's a, it's a uh, wood shingle clad house with uh, some uh, Victorian elements. We have the oval uh, windows in the eaves. We have uh, this extenuated rake detail with past crowns that come above. We have uh, the, the classical Tuscan columns that support the roof uh, element. And we're doing the ellipse opening at the porch level over the master um, bedroom. So we talked about, I, I think there's gonna be discussion on uh, height 
we did talk about mean grade, and we've calculated mean grade in our office at 27.5. There is, uh, uh, we've had two other uh, third party reviews look at it. Um, and I think Grady will talk about that later tonight, but we did it at 27.5, and that's how we determined our, um, our building compliance. So the building itself is 32 feet tall from the first floor line to the peak. Um, and if you take the mean grade measurements, we're at 33.5 at 27.5 elevation. How did you calculate mean grade? Uh, we calculated to do to again within the bylaw. The bylaw uh, we calculated from a point, the points here and throughout here within 10 feet of the uh, uh, new structure. So is, are, are you indicating that you made two point estimates? To get 27.5, we calculated this point in a point in, in a point at this level to get our 27.5 calculation. Okay. Wouldn't you have to go around the whole building? Can you go back to the site plan with the uh, pre-construction grade on it? Yes. <clears throat> Does that have pre-construction or post-construction uh, grade? This is pre-construction grade. S so the calculation is mean or average within 10 uh, feet. You know, you could probably take a simple calculation and just do the lowest point and the highest point, unless it's uneven uh, or there's like a bunk, big piece of ledge or something like that. <clears throat> you, could, you could certainly do a dot matrix within 10 feet of, of, the, uh, of the existing um, or the pre-existing structure and and do a bunch of points halfway, 10 feet out. But are you saying, can you, can you go to the point that you just described and how you came up with 27.5? Yeah, we came at 31. We came at 31 at this corner. Oh. Okay, 31 was, was post-construction grade? Pre-construction grade. Okay. No, excuse me, it is. 32.4 and 24.7. You're okay. saying, saying on the opposite <laughs> side. So the, but in the back, it's, um, it's like down to 23. 22. You're saying in the front, at the front, um, what? looks like at the front elevations, you're hitting 31 for a high. And at the back, you're hitting 24. Well, you can go within 10 feet of the structure, right? So you could pick a point. We picked 32.4, and then we picked. <clears throat> which was the corner of the existing building. But you are aware of the fact that you have to maintain a consistent perimeter around the structure, correct? Right. Yes. So in each measurement that you took, it was the same distance from the foundation. That's correct. We did have that checked by two other, it obviously is two other people who uh, third parties checked the grade as well. Um, they came in, a, you know, obviously they came in a little lower than we did, but within the range, right? Part of, part of the, the problem is the ambiguity in the bylaw that doesn't give a specific uh, formula or section to do that. So that leads to some discrepancies when we call in the third party people. Well, you know, I've always understood that, um, that uh, to do a pre-construction grade, you draw a 10 foot offset um, from, you know, whatever that existing structure was uh, and, uh, and then, and mean is what's 
the average grade. So you would take, um, um, you know, median is is in the middle between the high and the low. Can you can you bump that up a little bit? Bump this up. Yeah, at least around the around the existing structure. <clears throat> yeah. So, so this is thirty this is thirty two point four here, twenty four point seven here, twenty two and a half there. So if you took that diagonal. Right, but if you draw it, if you drew an offset around around the entire perimeter of ten feet, if you have a well, well, well uh, oh, excuse me, uh, sorry. You, you can you can pick any point within the ten feet. Is it, that's the way the bar bylaw reads, correct? No, no, that's well, no it's 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 no, the no, pre-construction grade within ten feet of the outside walls of the structure. So the way it was explained to us. Uh, that you could pick any point, offset any point within that 10 foot uh, dimension, as long as you uh, maintained your offset throughout the, throughout the uh, perimeter. Yep, but, but in the back of the house, you have a, what, elevation 21.4, 20.7, I mean. So the back of the house is 22.5 and 25 feet. <clears throat> what am I reading here? That it says 21.4 and 27 with a 21, 21 foot line going through the backyard there. Well, so if you look at the spot grades at the, so that's, that's a contour line. But if yeah. you look at the spot grades at the corner of the house, you see 22.5. And if you look at this corner, there's a spot elevation that says 25. And then right here at the spot elevation of this corner is 32.4. And this one is 24.7. Right, but, but, but you're, you're still, you know, it, in order to, to calculate the, the, the grade, you, you can't take a point at the foundation. You've got to go 10 feet outside walls. It says pre-construction ground within 10 feet of the outside walls of the structure. So, so, so if you did a perimeter and then you offset it 10 feet and then you find your low spot within, within 10 feet or 10 feet away from the structure and your, and your high spot, then you could, you could take an average from that between those two. Well, that's what mean calculates out at. I mean, uh, I mean just look. So, Looking at this, your high within 10 feet is, is 33. Your low is, let's say, 21. Okay. Well, again, the way it was explained to us is you have that 10-foot dimension, and you can offset. You could go right to, the, right to the foundation line, or you could offset 10 feet. Who told you that? I, I, don't, I, don't, see that, I don't see that reading of the... In the in the bylaw for the for the yeah. definition of height. Okay, so I um, that's how we interpret it. I think we uh, we, the problem, we uh, but the problem is if you use thirty three and twenty one, the average height, average pre construction grade would be twenty six. Now that's that's just looking at it. Twenty six um, becomes a problem for your overall height. Um, could I ask you, Mr. D'Souza, you, you're, you're describing someone explaining to you how this works. Can you enlighten us as to how it was it was described to you and by whom? Well, I think we asked for clarification from the building department, and that was what we, we got back for an, an answer. Um, we also, and, 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 I, and Madam Chair, um, my name is Souza. No, I'm sorry, we, I, I realized that and I apologize immensely. We brought the D a while ago, but uh, it's fine. No, no, uh, no. So, so I, again, we, we're architects to some degree. We relied on, on um, guidance from the civil people as well as we asked for um, guidance from the department when we were going through these calculations, which, you know, we were in, you know, when we did the calculations, we were 18 inches under. Um, so we, you know, we thought we had a good buffer piece for that being 18 inches under if you look at uh, our elevations, right? So uh, if you look at our elevate, you know, our original elevations, 
you know, we were at 30, 33, five. So we were looking at 18 inches under. Um, it, the height did come up because there was some um, uh, confusion in some drawings that we came up. So the town hired Amory to do a third party review of grading on this site. Amory came back with 26.5 and said we were still in conformance with the zoning bylaw for height. So at the last meeting they were saying, well, there's two, there's, there's two, you know, you're at 20, you're at uh, 27.5 and he's at, and he's at 26.5. There seems to be some discrepancy in that. So the, uh, the developer was asked to hire another third party review, which was Grady. Um, and he calculated this, you know, the, these are civil engineers, their calculations are, uh, uh, better than sort of an architect would do, right? So they understand grading and heights and measurements better than we would do. He came in at uh, 27 for an average mean grade that brought us to still in compliance for, for the building height. Um, how come you didn't um, use the, the civil engineer of record, the one that you went through CONCOM with, uh, Hardy? to do a calculation of, uh, of, of the pre-construction grade within 10 feet of the structure? So I think, I think when, we, when, when uh, the project architect was working on the project, he, he realized when he did the calculation, he realized it was 18 inches. He probably should have went back to Hardy and, and clarified that um, and made sure we had the, the proper documentation but at that point, um, we, um, we, were, we were already asked to have the town on a third party review. So rather than complicate it, we just let the third party review person from the town, Amory, calculate the existing grades. Um, did the, uh, where, where did the original grades come from and what was the engineering firm site plan that you started from? Was it the Hoyt site plan? Yes. Okay, so did you contact and contract with Mr. or Mrs. Hoyt to have them then sign the plan that was provided to the original homeowner as part of the sales process? So, uh, well, I don't know exactly. So we were provided, uh, uh, our office was provided from, by uh, a survey plan by Hoyt, as well as a um, civil plan by Hardy. And we were provided that by the developer. We didn't contract those, uh, those two consultants directly. So it sounds to me like there's a, a, a discussion about the way in which the town has on a precedent basis implemented the measurement of what we would call the ground elevation. And the application that you applied uh, in terms of the numbers of points that were used uh, seemed to be a sticking point in terms of the ability to generate sufficient information to draw a conclusion about what might be considered an average. Well, I think, I think, I mean, we've had three people look at it. I think they've really, I really, I think they really sort of decided what the average grade is uh, with three different, um, you know, two different third party reviews looking at the site. They're all basing that off the original survey that was done in May of 19 from Hoyt. It is true, but it wasn't signed by an engineer. It is, yeah, it's signed. Well, it may be eventually, but in terms of the documentation that the town received, we didn't have a signature. No, no, well, it would, I, I don't know. So we, we didn't have a signature in our office. So in our set, we, in, in, our, in our set we sent to the town, we didn't have a signature in the office, but the, the, but the, the, 
he certainly signed this on 6519. Um, and certainly maybe it was when they said to us earlier, he didn't stamp that. So a lot of engineers only don't send digital stamps and they only have wet stamps. But I, I, I don't know why the town wouldn't have a copy and why the town wouldn't would accept a um, non-stamped survey plan. Because to go through, to go through uh, um, water management in that sort of the hearings they went for, for with Hardy, they certainly would have had stamped drawings for, for, to, to be uh, heard. So I guess it's part of our, part of our uh, when we submitted the package to the town in June, we didn't have a stamped um, drawing in our possession, but I'm sure the town would never have let uh, someone go in front of a board and discuss engineering calculations without a stamp drawing. So we, 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 uh, we found the stamp drawing eventually, and then this is it. So this was, he, he did this on 605, and he stamped it on 605.19, and, uh, and that's, that was the original drawing that we had. So let's continue, but I would, I guess it's probably appropriate at this moment to ask our peer reviewer to, um, uh, we have two actually, but really the one that is specifically um, been asked to address the question of height, to, to talk us through how they thought about their measurements. Because I think what is being asked is to what extent was the mechanism used, the number of points that were surveyed uh, sufficient to provide you with a clear understanding of what the pre-construction grade was. So I would ask if you don't mind, and this is up to you because this is your presentation, if you would like to ask Mr. Grady to talk. I think this is a good time to, <clears throat> I think this is a good time to ask him. So, cause he can certainly add some clarification to what he's done. He's done, ex he's, done an extensive survey of the property in that in, in those pieces. So we have no problem stopping the presentation so we could sort of clarify for the board that we do meet the height requirements. Great, thank you very much. Mr. Grady. Mr. Grady is uh, from Grady uh, Corporation and um, uh, has offered information to the town and also to the um, developer. Hi, can you hear me okay? Oh, is my volume working? Perfect. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, can I share my screen? Oh, yeah. Do I have to hold on? And I might confuse you with this one because I know I'm on twice, one with my PC and one, one with my, let's see. There we go. Oh, All right, uh, Rick Grady from Grady Consulting. Uh, we were asked to measure, survey the building height here, um, which was the easy part of this job, and also to calculate that uh, building height based on the mean level of the pre-construction ground within 10 feet of the outside walls of the structure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, as was mentioned, the definition in the bylaw is not very specific, so it does leave some room for interpretation. Um, that interpretation is generally uh, settled by the zoning enforcement officer if there's uh, any questions. So I'd like to kind of walk you through what we did out here to come to our conclusions. Uh, we started with the Hardy plan, Hardy site plan, uh, which we understand is based on the Peter Hoyt uh, existing conditions survey. Uh, we don't see any discrepancies between the two plans. They both depict existing grade consistently. Uh, the Hardy plan called out two structures in the street, a sewer manhole cover and also a drainage catch basin cover. Uh, and I'm sorry that I don't have his plan right now, but we did check into those elevations and spot check some elevations uh, along the street. So we were confident that we um, 
got onto their datum for the purposes of measuring the building height. So I'll start with the building height uh, and I'm gonna jump back to a different um, visual here for you. We provided our conclusions of the building elevations uh, on a side elevation of the structure. Uh, we actually shot the peak elevation here at elevation 66.9. We shot this little angle point of this slope roof here at elevation 55.6. That re and this is the highest flat portion of roof on the structure. We counted this steeper portion of roof as wall, so we did not include that uh, as a portion of the roof. We assumed that was basically a wall uh, given the style of the house. So it's entirely based on this single slope roof along the top here. That gave us a midpoint of the slope roof at elevation 61.3. Coming back to the mean level of the pre-construction ground within 10 feet of the outside walls, we had a little difficulty putting all the different plans together. Um, so we actually traced each one of them in AutoCAD just to give myself a little bit more ability to, to see what was going on here. Uh, the existing structure is located uh, right here. The proposed structure is located right here, where I'm highlighting. The 10 foot offset is located right here. Our highest elevation within 10 feet of the proposed structure was up in this corner here. You can see this contour line coming through here, which is elevation 32. The lowest contour is down here at elevation 22. So based on the bylaw and past projects that we've been involved with on in town and our understanding of the zoning enforcement officer's interpretation, we took the elevation 32, took the elevation 22, uh, in the mean or average of those two elevations was elevation 27. So we came back to this graphic, we plugged in the elevation 27. Based on that, we came up with the building height to the midpoint here of 34 foot, four inches. We came up with a ridge line height of 39 foot, uh, 11 inches. I'm sorry, um, kind of Richard that can you go back to that graphic? Yes, be glad to. Uh, what you're you're pointing at. It says ridge line height 39 foot 11. That's um, to a line that goes vertically to the So you're, you're pointing at a, a, a line, not actually at the ridge. Correct. I was just trying to, it isn't, I, I can zoom in a little closer here. No, I just wanted to understand your graphic that, that it's a line that you're, you're calculating yeah. above your average um, grade calculation. That, that's correct. And that line was going from, uh, oops, sorry about the pop up there, going from 27 down here to the ridge peak up here. So yep. it's ele elevation 66.9 minus elevation 27 uh, to come up with the 39.9 or 39 foot 11 inches. And that's correct. I'm pointing to the line. Yep. Uh, for a, a portion of this, we actually scanned the backside of this, uh, figuring this was the highest. And I realized that this isn't. Um, Go to full screen here for you. I realize this isn't our highest point, but I, I found this helpful just to maybe check a couple of measurements in here where I can kind of rough check some, oops, sorry. This gets a little jumpy sometimes. So this lets us kind of pick a rough midpoint on the roof down to, and I realize this is proposed grade. But we find this to be a helpful tool to check some of these things. So on a point like right there, we're at about 34 foot, five inches. Um, 
So I was able to use this as basically a check of our total station survey of each of these angle points uh, that we located. And we were able to check a few other points along here. This was more secondary check for us than the initial survey, uh, but it does give us some helpful graphical information to refer back to. So based on that, our conclusion was that the building height was at um, 34 foot 4 inches and the ridge line height was 39 foot 11 inches. So Mr. Grady, how many um, uh, measurements did you make? Two. It was based on the two measurements that we pointed out, the high and the low. Uh, and, we do. Uh, uh, and, and could you uh, help us understand how it was that you decided that, that two measurements were the appropriate number? And, uh, and really, uh, we're asking this because we're trying to figure out how even our own policy works. So I, I'm asking, you know, were two measures enough in order to be able to really ascertain what the uh, pre-construction grade was. It, there's really two different ways wrong to word. look. I use the wrong <clears throat> word, pre-construction ground grade. Okay. Yeah, there are a number of different ways to look at that mean grade. Uh, what I kept coming back to on that was the bylaw in the past um, projects that we had been involved with where it was deemed acceptable in, by the zoning enforcement officer to base that mean grade off of two points. Uh, we do work in numerous towns and there are other towns that specifically describe how they want that to be calculated. Um, I believe it's uh, Wellesley has one where we do a similar thing 10 feet off of the foundation and we have to take a spot grade every 10 feet around that 10 foot perimeter. And that has to be depicted on the site plans that are presented to the building department. Uh, Nantucket has a similar um, prescribed method to do the pre-existing mean grade. Um, so ours was really just based on past work that we had done in Cohasset and our understanding of the zoning enforcement officer's interpretation of how that's calculated. Uh, thank you for that. I meant to say ground um, in terms of the the basis upon which we we're making an estimation. Was that checked in any way to see what the precedent was for how the town actually applies that particular part of its zoning bylaw? I, I did speak with Mr. Egan today. I actually hadn't spoken with them before today. I was going off of just other projects that we had done in town, uh, but I did want to at least have a conversation with them today to make sure that that was consistent with his uh, view of it as well. And he stated that it was. Thank you. Could you just add one bit more of information, which is when um, a, uh, an alternative mechanism is used or, or way of understanding what the ground level is, can you describe what that means? How many points are involved uh, and how that in, encapsulates the, the building uh, perimeter? Yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to. Um, as I think everybody's aware by now, each of these contour dashed lines here are contour lines. Uh, they each depict a two foot change in elevation. Uh, you can see that those changes in elevation are closer together along this side of the house here, less present in this area here. So if we look at the higher part of the lot around elevation 30 to 32 over on this side here versus 20, two and a half to 22 on this side, we have probably 60% of this house that is in an area that is in the low to mid 20s in elevation. And we have about 40% of the house that is, I'll say over elevation 25. So what happens on those other methods is it gives a higher weight to the final conclusion 
toward the lower numbers. So if we were to take a spot elevation, say every 10 feet around this 10 foot offset, then that same mean grade conclusion would be more in the range of roughly elevation 25. Uh, thank you for that. And can you tell me something about the error of contour lines? I'm not really familiar with how they're um, judged, if you will, for their accuracy. They're actually, they're fairly accurate. The assumption with contour lines is that um, I should probably refer to Mr. Hoyt's plan, but I'll do it based off of uh, what I have up here on the screen. A series of um, shots are taken in most cases with a total station and each one of these here would depict one of those survey elevations. As long as the ground is uniform slope between each of those shots, you get a highly accurate contour map. Uh, if there's any undulations or irregularities in that slope, um, then you do get some error in the contours. Um, based on the number of shots that I saw on the spot elevations, I tr traced them as best I could in these green and yellow uh, shots. It looked like they had adequate shots to correctly or accurately depict the uh, contour elevations. But from your own indications, it would suggest that there's a, a, high, a very high and then a lower um, display across the, the uh, landscape in this particular image, right? So we go from 34 down to 20, 22, 21, something like that. So with that amount of gradient, um, how do you finally decide what's the right number? For the placement of the contours? Yes, that and, and also the, the level of, of trying to reconcile exactly what the ground level is when it comes to a, using the Cohasset bylaw as your guide. Sure. Um, so in order to go from these survey points to uh, contours, it's really a pretty simple formula where it's the change in elevation over the distance here. And that comes up with a slope between each set of points. And then it does what it called a triangulated irregular network where it'll figure out in this case here, 30 to 31.4. And that 31.4 is actually back here. There's no even increments between that. However, it's gonna look up here between the 31.4 and the 34.2. And there's going to be a 32 passing through there, and there's going to be a 34 passing through there. And the survey software is going to look at every set of points within usually 75 feet of each other to create this triangulated irregular network or TIN to come up with the uh, contours. Um, as far as applying that to the bylaw, it's sort of gets off of the survey at that point, and this 32 contour becomes the highest, in this particular case. The grays were able to drop spot elevations onto that modeled surface. So each one of these gray numbers is something that's added after the fact. I added those for my own benefit just to start dropping some grades onto the contours. And then obviously we had about 22 on the bottom down here, which is where we got the 32 to the 22. So in an instance like this, where you have an irregular topography, um, the way to increase the precision of your estimate would be to have more points. Is that right? Correct. That's right. And so the fewer the points, the higher the air, potentially. Now let's yes. say that yep. the range of answers could be larger if you only had a few points. This project is a perfect example of that. So, so from the standpoint of, of um, trying to kind of wrestle this into shape and, and move on because this is only a part of the, the study, 
we're faced with a situation in which we have a range of values and uh, that we have a high range and a low range of values. And um, if you were to use a, a precise metric, you know, around the, the structure, we would come up potentially with a different average than if we were to use just two points. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, for us as uh, members of the Cohasset Planning Board, because we're always trying to improve our policies and, and, and we're trying to learn from every experience about how to be better planners. This would be a nice one to tighten up a little bit. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's turn it back over to Mr. Souza and uh, let's continue through the project plan. Green. Okay, uh, we left off at, uh, this is that side elevation that shows a porch wrapping around. Uh, we, we, we've designed a chimney on the left-hand side of the building, and this is the elevation of the screen porch, and we're repeating that, those classical columns on the screen porch, uh, as well as doing some recessed panels. Again, in some of Mr. Grady's photos, you saw the detail of the rake that we're using. We're doing a little rake return here that will have a little copper accent. This is the rear of the building. This is the master bedroom here. This is the garage level. Uh, we've talked about any lighting on the rear of the building being dark sky compliant. Um, on the right side, you see a screen porch. This is the dining room area. There's a deck that leads off there and a deck that leads off the mud room. There is uh, two French doors leading to the basement level. Again, we're repeating that. The Gambrel uh, gables run through the building and show up at the back. We're doing those two little pieces here. We're doing some shed dormers above and we're doing some dog wood dog uh, shed dormers on uh, the garage level. And we skewed the garage in plan to add interest to the overall site and make the parking a little more accessible. This is the garage elevation, which is significantly lower than, uh, four feet lower than the existing gable above. And you can see a bay element that comes out in the front as well as a small doghouse dormer on the side wall of the Gambrel. And this is what it looks like in perspective. You can see in this level here, we're doing a, a retaining wall. Um, this graphic uh, shows Pennsylvania flagstone. What we're proposing in the other graphic is the Weymouth indigenous stone to the site, which is a Weymouth granite, uh, but you can see we are, we are creating a plinth in front of the house for two reasons we think that grounds the house nicely as well as it manages our stormwater. You can see we have a two car uh, entrances to the garage and this is uh, an entrance to the mudroom here. Uh, we are doing that uh, long exterior porch in the front and the Tuscan columns. Uh, we are sheathing the entire house with wood shingles. Um, and we have a decorative bay off that gable there. Uh, we do have that curved element over the master bedroom with the railing uh, in that garage gable. Uh, again, in the, uh, over the attic space, we have a little outlook over the site to see the water. You can see some landscape lighting in that piece there. Here's a better view of the garage area and looking back towards the house. But, you know, we strove to use the vocabulary of the existing neighborhood. Uh, we did, you know, we did pump up the design a little bit, sort of grounding in that, in that proportion of the shingle style Gambrell house. Um, and we did add elements 
of sort of Victorian nature with this bay, copper roofed bay element, oval windows in that same piece. And uh, that's it for my presentation. I can answer any questions you have. So thank you very much. And um, uh, typically what happens next is that individual planning board members uh, will make commentary. Then we will move to public discussion. And then we'll wrap back around, make sure that everybody knows what's going on and feels uh, comfortable with the information that's been generated. Uh, and then the planning board may come back and, and make some comments as well. So um, uh, let me uh, begin by asking uh, planning board members, and I will do it on an alphabetical basis. So Clark Brewer, would you like to comment? Um, well, you know, I'd say uh, generally speaking, it's an attractive design. Uh, obviously, it's a, 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 a little bit uh, tighter uh, lot than the house uh, had existing, you know, I, I think that, you know, some of the design moves are, you know, perfectly uh, in keeping with the upmarket um, approach. Um, and the calculation with the high and the low point in terms of the grade, I think that's, um, that, that was adequately <coughs> um, addressed by um, Richard Grady. Um, you know, generally speaking, the, the large home review process is a way for neighbors to see what's happening before the, the project's actually built or, or at the stage where it is now. Um, I know there was a calculation mistake, um, and uh, that's why we're here after the fact. But, but based on what uh, Mr. Sousa has, has shown us in his presentation, um, I, I, th I think we're we have the ability to approve or approve with conditions um, as a net result of, of our meeting. Um, and I can't think of, if we've got the height issue resolved, I can't think of any conditions uh, that we would apply to this particular um, large home review. All right, thank you. Uh, Tom Callahan. Um, well, I, I don't, I, you know, if we resolve the height issue and we don't have any contrary evidence, I don't, you know, there's nothing we can do about it at this point. I personally think this probably exceeds the height limit, um, certainly too close for comfort. Um, but, you know, if again, if the people in town hall are telling them you can just use two points, uh, it just points out problems we've had over the years with the height bylaw and the definition of height. Um, you know, nothing in that definition tells me that you only use two points, and I don't understand where that interpretation is coming from. But if that's what everybody's relied on and it's incorrect, and it's the, in, you know, it's incorrect because of our, what the building inspector is telling everybody. I don't think we have any grounds to do anything. Um, you know, as far as the rest of the large home review bylaw, it doesn't give us much teeth to do anything. I think we've complied with the standards that are in it, such as they are. And, uh, you know, and I'm still not happy with the way act. I don't believe this was an innocent mistake. Um, you know, come to learn since the last time we got together that, you know, you were at the CONCOM in. 2019 with the description of a 5,000 square foot house. Uh, you know, there were two pieces of paper that were submitted then in October that had the 30. Uh, Tom, you might want to turn uh, off your. In August. I'm sorry. Can you, you hear you me? Want to turn off your, your uh, video so that we can hear you. Is that better? Yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just don't think there was an innocent mistake made here. And it should have been, you know, if you knew in August you had a 5,000 square foot house. And if the building inspector was making a mistake, you should have pointed that out to him. But, so I don't like how we're here. But also we've come to learn that the board itself has no power to do anything about it. So 
I'm reluctantly going to vote to support this, but I, I think this points out a hell of a lot of problems we have with our bylaw and with what goes on in reviewing these projects before it gets to the board. So um, that's all I got to say about it, I guess. All right, thank you for that. Is uh, Paul Grady here this evening? I don't see him in the lineup. Paul? He's not present. Yeah. Oh, all right, thank you. Uh, then we'll go to Eric Potter. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Hi, how's everybody doing? <laughs> um, so I, I, for one, don't like how we got here either way. I agree with Tom. Um, however, I am certainly not one to start to be skeptical of two peer reviews in addition to the original plans that were reviewed by the developer. Um, I respect Grady Consulting and everything that they do, and they are much more qualified to make an opinion about the height of this house, the median height of this house than I am. Um, so I think I would be in favor of moving forward um, with this approval based upon the information that we have in front of us. All right, I'm going to uh, ask the public's um, comments that might be made and then I'll make my own comments. Thank you. Amy, what about Paul Caleri? Oh, oh, uh, sorry, I, I um, Paul Caleri. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks, Clark. <laughs> um, I, I think the presentation was uh, well done. I think the house is uh, beautifully designed. And, um, you know, I share the same feeling as other board members. It's a little unfortunate that we had to kind of come around to it this direction. I think if it was, you know, presented like this in the beginning, it would have been, it would have been great and everyone would have just, you know, been happy with said design. But um, I, I have no issues and, and I think that the calculations are what we have done in the past and have set precedent. And uh, unless something changes otherwise, we'll continue to, you know, do business. Um, I think this shines a light on maybe some issues that some people might have. Um, but otherwise, I think it was a well done presentation and I think it's a beautifully designed home. That's all I have. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, use the prerogative of the chair at this moment to say that rather than having the public speak, I'll speak first. And that is, I'd like to have Mr. Souza to uh, show the back um, image of the house before it was demolished. Because the question is, what is the grade? What is the actual ground elevation? And uh, if the house actually had a basement, then the sill, which is seen on the plan that was developed by Hoyt, sets the base at a level that would suggest that the height of the house is higher than what is being estimated by the architect. And my view is that since uh, we did not have in our possession as members of the planning board, a signed document from the uh, uh, surveyor Hoyt upon which everything built, there is other ev uh, evidence that can be used to determine what the actual original ground level was. Now, interestingly, if there is a, a, a technology called LIDAR, which essentially is uh, um, uh, uh, sky to earth uh, radar that allows you to make estimates of the topography of land. And if you, if you look at the LIDAR survey that was done in 2014, the Hoyt survey, point by point and the LIDAR survey are very similar. And what they suggest is that the, the structure as designed is larger than what, is that, than what would qualify under the ZBA or, or under the zoning uh, ordinance. And so we have a situation in which we have empirical evidence that uh, uh, generates more than one uh, um, result. And uh, in discussing this issue, um, with Mr. Grady, he acknowledged that it was possible when you have so few points that you're working with, which is two, rather than 50 or 60, 
that the variation in the terrain could be significant enough where you could get a result that in fact does not represent um, uh, an average. And so my view is that uh, we did not have sufficient information and there is other information out there that would allow us to make a better determination of the size of the structure and the extent to which it is either equal to, less than, or over than what the bylaw uh, requires. So that's my comments. And with that, I will turn the... the uh, um, Amy, I do have a quick question about the, if you could clarify before we... Are, are you think, saying that perhaps that there was fill that came in? And that's what, um, after they demolished the old house or the old dwelling, they filled this, the, where the, the building envelope is now, which makes it higher than it would have been otherwise allowed to be? Uh, what I'm, I'm saying- I'm a little confused. I just want to understand what you're saying. What I'm saying is, is where they're measuring off of is actually lower than how it is represented in the calculations that were done by the architect. And if you match the Hoyt measurement to the LIDAR measurement, you actually see that the surface was lower. And so that means that as they add, they're, they are essentially um, adding uh, uh, height, but not necessarily having to account for it. And, and, the, uh, and, and empirically, it can be demonstrated that that is possible. And we could ask one, our, our, our peer review uh, for comment on that. Well, I mean, I'm looking at the Hoyt plan here and, and it looks like the, the 20, elevation 21 goes into what that 10 foot offset would be. Um, so it looks like it's, it's different than what I would have, what we saw from uh, Grady's analysis and in, in terms of um, uh, th this uh, Hoyt land surveying um, uh, plan. Can you be more specific than that, Clark? Elevation 21, you see that uh, underneath the deck on the plan? Elevation 21 goes up to the ledge, right? Oh, you mean on the east side? On the, that would be on the south side of the house. Um, yeah. Elevation 32, we know that hit the existing, uh, existing line and uh, that elevation is, would be um, that hit, uh, um, I'm sorry, elevation 32 was within the 10 foot, but it certainly looks like elevation 21 would be within the, within the 10 foot. Uh, but, you know, I, as I said before, um, Richard Grady did the calculation and he took two points, a high and a low. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't think that gives you mean per se uh, on uh, a lot that's um, not relatively flat. A, a high and a low would work fine for a flat lot, but not one with a big piece of ledge on it, right? <clears throat> um, right. And, and so from the standpoint of what finally makes the decision about the efficacy of the analysis is who's controls the determination of what the ground level is. And that actually isn't the planning board, that is the ZBA. So from my perspective, we could consider an approval, but it would have to be conditioned that this, it, this uh, case goes to the ZBA for final approval. That makes sense. Yeah. L Lauren, did you have something? Uh, I would just like to address um, Jen Orem and then our special counsel, Karis North. They um, are more well-versed on this, but they have some um, comments for the interpretation of the bylaw and what's allowed. Is it all right if I speak, Madam Chair? Oh, certainly. Uh, so just uh, speaking on behalf of, um, I'm the clerk for the zoning board and I also work in the building department and um, all of our applications that have um, need to have determinations of height and increases of height, that interpretation has always been since I've been there um, 
15 years this week, actually, um, is that it, you, the measurement is within, taken within 10 feet in one location and it has to be consistent around the house. Um, and then you take that average and that is the average. Um, so how they measured it, whether two points, there are industry standards that we can't speak to, um, but that is how we have always, and when I have an applicant ask how they should measure height, that is how I take, I, I, I tell them. So I know we talked about the two points, but again, industry standards vary depending on how you measure. Um, I also think it's really important to um, speak to the fact that, uh, that we need to be consistent with how we hear these applications. And so we have three people confirming the measurement of height is, is conforming. So I don't see how we can send this to the zoning board, speaking as someone who works there. So I think we have to look at this large home review um, as we have all other large reviews to cite the fact that we're an after the fact. We have to now just move forward and do that. So I just wanted to explain that that's how we have measured height. Um, has Bob explained it to Mr. Grady and as I've explained it to hundreds of applicants. And I know that Karis wanted to speak to it as well, if that's okay, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. I. I really just wanted to make a couple of points, which is that the bylaw definition of height doesn't require a number of points to be determined um, or the distance within the 10 feet uh, to make the measurements. Um, so as long as they are consistent with the precedent that has been established and consistent with, uh, you know, and our are measured from the same place, you then in making your determination, the bylaw, the planning board has to consider the evidence that's in the record. And the evidence that's in the record are uh, three different engineers that have done these measurements and concluded that the height is within the, um, the, the bylaw limitation. So I don't see any basis or reason from my perspective for this to go to the zoning board, um, I think you have all the evidence in the record that you need. I would, I would agree with that opinion of Jennifer Karras as well. We have three peer reviews here. If there was a dissenting opinion on what the median height would be, I would be more concerned. Um, but we have three professionals in the arena that are given the same opinion that there's, there's not something to be concerned with. So I would have to say we'd have to go with precedent here and how we've been handling these in the prior cases. Um, and, and it's not something to shoot off to the zoning board and potentially, you know, impact the, the, this, this owner any, any longer than he has. And, and I know he's, you know, had to jump through some hoops after the initial error. So um, that'd be my opinion on that. Thank you for that. I guess I'd respond in, in um, two ways to the two different comments. Number one, I wanna make sure that I understand what Jen is saying, that the advice of the building inspector is that there are multiple points around the foundation that would be the basis upon which ultimately the ground level would be determined. Is that what you're saying, Jen? That, the, that, that what would have been told to the engineers as to how many points they needed to use would have been more than two. We would never have, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we would never have advised them as to how many um, points unless they were asked and say, does two sound like that would work? All we say is that we have to, it has to be taken from the same point with, at the same distance within the 10 feet all the way around the perimeter of the home, of the proposed structure. We don't say how many points. That is an industry choice, how these engineers choose to measure. Does that uh, make more sense? Uh, yes. No, no. I, I want, just wanted to confirm that yeah. you were in fact saying what you were saying because that is not what I understand. Well, and, I, and that I, I would say that I would um, appeal to the record to demonstrate that there is evidence to show that in each case that is exactly what someone is told. Because it really matters here. More points, more data, more precision. And our problem is we have two data points and that is not very much information to work from. So my suggestion response to that, if I may, is that then if there's an improvement to make going forward, we should do that. But I know that, um, again, 
I've never discussed points. I've just, dis I've just discussed the bylaw and what it says. And say, I say around the base of the structure, it has to be the average between the 10 feet. So I've never discussed points. Um, so, I mean, I think that's something to look at um, for the future. I, I will say that we don't need to look at the future. I would argue that I have submitted information that is based on scientific evidence to suggest that when you use more points and you use the same perimeter format, you end up with a different result. And my conversations with Mr. Grady suggests that that is entirely possible. It is not, it is not verified in the peer review analysis that he did for us because he operated on the basis of his understanding of cohesive precedent. What I am suggesting is there is information that exists that will allow you to get a greater, a, a higher degree of fidelity in the analysis that we're undertaking. Why would you apply that here and not in other cases? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't see why you would just start doing that here uh, and not moving forward with perhaps changing the procedures, especially when you have someone that works at the town that saying how it's administered or how it's directed to people that come in to get what, these people. What I would say, my, my, my request was simply that there is an, a difference of opinion, that the opinion is most appropriately provided by the ZBA and not from the planning board. We don't regulate that. It's not a difference of opinion with regards to the median height though, yeah. and whether it's a violation. May I be heard on this matter, Madam Chair? May. Mr. Grady presented um, two examples, Nantucket as well as Wellesley, um, having different criteria for how many points are measured. And while there may be occasions where a different um, calculation could be derived from a different point on the lot, especially in the case of an unusual lot like this that has ledge, and as you know, Cohasset is full of those. Um, I, I don't think it would be reasonable to apply this um, to the present case um, retroactively. If the town wants to evaluate this and reshape its law prospectively, um, that's something that I would encourage. I don't see how this would go to the zoning board. Um, town council has provided a analysis as well as um, Ms. Orem with the um, insight that she has as to the process. And there's been compliance. We have three different uh, professionals who have provided a <clears throat> clarification as to the height. And if there's a better way of doing it in the future, that's something I'm sure the town can evaluate. Um, at present, my client has been fully cooperative with this process. Chris, and who are you? Are you counsel for the I'm, owner? I am. Okay. I'm counsel for um, the owner. And it's really been a delay since, um, since June in terms of the scope of work we can do. And we still have a permit. There's been no revocation of the permit. We've been fully cooperative with the process. Um, you know, um, I, I grew up in Newton with shingle style homes like this. It, it's a beautiful home. Grace is a neighborhood. Um, the quality of the workmanship is it's fantastic. And, um, you know, we'd like to move forward with it. Um, there's I, been- I appreciate been your a, comments, Mr. Greeley. Um, and, uh, and I thoroughly agree with you that the aesthetic of the, the project is, is really quite beautiful. What I will say is that there is a way to estimate a more precise answer to this question. And since from the very beginning, we didn't start out with a perfect packet and we have been growing with our understanding of the situation. The fact that there is a possibility to have an, an accurate answer beyond two points does raise question about what we're willing to, to use as information to make decisions. Aren't you always going to have better ways of doing things? So that's why the supporting bylaws are revised and improved upon and, and, and revisited year after year. You're, you're usually improving upon things, but you don't do it necessarily with a specific case. You see how it's being applied with each <clears throat> applicant that comes before you, and you have meetings about what could be improved upon and then put those into motion. Um, in, in this particular instance, we have precedent that's been set. We have two peer reviews um, 
and while the process didn't go in the, in a linear way that we usually expect, it, it seems as, and I, that's why I appreciate your opinion, Amy, because you bring up points that I want to think of. And I do think it's something to re revisit down the line. And, uh, but with this particular case in front of us, um, I, I don't know if it's, it's fair to do it with this applicant. Amy. Okay, so uh, well, is, that, is that Clark? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Listen, I, I think, um, I think that uh, 0 0.9 or 0 0.1 of a foot under is a kind of indication that there's a problem here. And, and I don't think the planning board's responsibility in this is to determine zoning compliance. Um, um, I, I think that uh, Grady's interpretation is the most generous um, interpretation. And I'm frankly for um, recommending as a part of our approval that this go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, because I, I don't think there's a problem with the with the zoning bylaw. I mean, to, to me, I read it and it's it's the the mean level within 10 feet for pre-construction grade, and then that allows you to set that set that peak. I I think it's clear, and the only question is how many points. And 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 as I said before, for a site that's relatively flat. Two points is perfectly adequate, a high and a low. There's nothing wrong with that. But for a for a site that has um, has you know ten feet of slope and a big piece of ledge on it, the um, I don't think the two points is enough. Um, and I I I I'm for recommending that the ZBA um, decide on whether this is this this meets the bylaw for height or, or not. So I would make a motion to recommend that that, um, that the, from a large home, home perspective, um, the design is great, everything looks good, um, but there's a height, there appears to be a height problem that the ZBA is the, is the board to, to determine that problem resolution, not this one. Thank you, um, uh, I concur with that. Uh, so let's turn our uh, attention now to the public. And um, uh, Lauren and Jen will serve, uh, just a minute, I see Karis North uh, wishing to speak, our council. All I'm gonna say, Madam Chair, is that the ZBA is gonna look at the exact same information um, that is in front of this board. Um, and if asked, we'll give them the same recommendation, which is you have three peer reviews and three engineers, and you have to base your decision on the evidence that's in the record. And the evidence that's in the record says this is a compliant project. And I don't believe that it is within the ability of the planning board to ignore that evidence. It certainly isn't, well, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And it, it's and certainly thank you. not our intention, Madam Chair, to pursue an injunction or do anything. We, we want to work with the town. And, the, and honestly, the town really wants to work with you. So this is not about a, uh, this is not a fist fight. This is actually a question about how to do a good job and make sure we do the right job. And in response to Ms. North, I really appreciate your comment. I do look back in the history of how planning boards worked before they had staffs. And members of the planning board actually did analysis because there wasn't staff to do analysis. And so my own feeling is that there is information that is out there that can be used to settle this. But my own view is only one of the members of the board. So I'm going to move it to the, to the public and then we will make a determination. So thank you, but I appreciate your comments. After we go to the public, we have one question um, in the Q&A. Um, I did just want to mention one more thing about the zoning board when we get before you make a motion to, uh, the one question um, is, um, did they take, it's from Barbara C, but she does not have her name or address. Um, and then Rob Jeffers, I know who he is, but he's, um, it says, would, would, they didn't put their addresses, but I'll look them up. Um, did they take into consideration visual scale of the house to lot? And that's for this. That's for the applicants. I don't really understand the question, but and uh, if, would you suggest that? I, I guess I would 
say that that question would probably profit from being discussed by the architect. Correct. And then I have one more from Rob Jeffers, which I can read after that. Yeah, so when designing the house, we did take in consideration, right? It's based upon a uh, proportionary system of the shingle style. Uh, we did look at how the, uh, the peaks were, uh, what proportion they were, what proportion the, the porch was uh, relative to that, those pieces. So that, I mean, listen, we studied um, the design of this house uh, uh, for a great deal of time. We're very proud of the end, uh, end result. And I think that it, it shows a, uh, a well-designed proportioned house to the lot. All right, thank you very much. All um, right, and the other one is from Robert Jeffers and he says, it would seem that if the town wants to mandate the number of points, it should say that in the bylaws. If two points have been accepted in the past, it seems unfair to change. The problem is if you say over 10 feet, you can then argue five feet or better or every one foot. I think the town should be consistent and then update the bylaws going forward. And that's from Robert Jeffers of 18 Springsteen. And that's all we have for public comment. Um, if I may just mention the one thing about the zoning board is that there's presently um, a building permit that's been issued for this project. Um, building permits are not usually issued for projects that need special permits or determination by the zoning board. I don't understand how um, the planning board can refer it or condition it. It would have to be the applicant would have to just file it. Um, again, I appreciate what everything that um, Madam Chair is saying. I understand about getting new information, but I do think once again, just my advice is to be, is that we need to be consistent. Um, and we have three parent reviewers and I'm, I'm certain we've had lots that have been uneven that have been before us um, that have done the measurements the same way. So that's all I'm gonna say. I don't know how this will get to the um, zoning board if there's already an issued building permit. Um, and the person that would send that to the zoning board would be the building inspector. Is that right, Karis? It's generally, yes. that, that's, that's who would determine that it needs to go to the zoning board. So that's all. And so I just think we need to think about that and think of where we are. And um, I agree that there is probably some, um, that there's work. We've talked about this before in the office that, that we would like a, a better way to, for understanding the height. And um, we have a working zoning working group. It, Tom can write it. <laughs> um, but I just, I'm sorry that I've spoken so much, but zoning is something that I, that I live and the building office is what I live. And so I just wanted to make those few points as well. And, and actually it's really important that you do do that because you have the years of experience and have observed what the town has done over a long period of time. So what I conclude from this discussion is that uh, there is no remedy that the planning board can seek based on where it could, what, what leverage it has to actually request that this be moved to the Zoning Board of Appeals. You are confirming that, Jen, right? That's my understanding based on where we are now with the process. All right. And Clark, is that your understanding as well? Tom has a question. Uh, sorry, well, I, 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 Amy. I just want to point out. You know, that I'm going to put on my land use lawyer hat for a minute, and um, I'm going to agree with Karis. Is that you know, when we make these decisions, we have to have a basis in the record to make them. Um, I think this one is slipping through the cracks. I can't stand the way this came to us. I can't stand the way that it is going to slip through the cracks. But the record before us does not have any evidence that they've exceeded the height. If this LIDAR information actually showed that and was before us tonight, that would be a different thing. And there's nothing that prevents one of us board members from introducing to that into the record, but it's not. The record we have before us, unfortunately, is leading us to the conclusion that we can't do anything about this tonight and this one's gonna get away from us. I agree with Karis, and we can't go down the road of, of making decisions without a basis in the record. If, you know, if I'm going to stand for anything on this board, it's going to be about process and, you know, keeping us out of court and, and, and having legally defensible decisions. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, I, I, 
we, we can't do anything about this one. And, you know, I don't care it's taken since June. Again, I don't think the developer is innocent here, but there's nothing we can do about it, unfortunately. And I, I would just say, you know, based on, um, I think what, what Jen just said, that the, the large home review is a part of our zoning and we are allowed to make, um, we can approve and we can approve with conditions. And if one of our conditions is that this uh, needs to go to the uh, zoning board of appeals, um, then that's just as defensible as a part of our zoning. So I, I, I would disagree that um, just because a building permit's been issued, um, that's, that wouldn't be the first time that a building permit's been issued that, that a, a problem came up that had to be resolved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, we, How, we, however, we you're... Consultant. We have a consultant who said that he just used two points. And he confirmed that with the zoning officer. But this site is not a flat site. And I think the two points is, is inadequate to determine mean, which is average. Mean, you look it up in the dictionary. Um, mean grade. Um, I, I don't, I mean, in the past where, where we've had large home reviews, where they've, they've had a zoning uh, issue, we've, we've sent them to the zoning board typically before we have a large home review. But this, this whole thing has been um, messed up. So I, I think the, the fallout of that is, is not our board's fault. Right. Nobody, Clark, nobody's saying it's our fault, but yeah. that's right. You know, so I, I, I agree with you that the definition of height in our bylaw doesn't lead to a conclusion that you only use two points. I think if our building department is interpreting that way, interpreting it that way, they're wrong too. But there is such a thing about being told that by the building department, a concept called detrimental reliance, that I, I, I think our our hands are tied here, unfortunately. I wish they weren't. I wish they weren't. But um, I, there's nothing in the record, in our record, that can give us the basis to go to the zoning board. We're speculating that height is off. I agree that the speculation is it may very well be off, but there's nothing here definitive that says it's off that's in the record as it exists at this moment. So unfortunately, we've got to let it go. Um, so, uh, is Mr. Grady still with us? I don't believe he is. Yes. He is. Uh, Mr. Grady, could we, um, engage this a little bit further just, uh, so that we can bring it to a conclusion? Uh, you and I were, uh, communicating this afternoon in which I, um, presented to you some information about the use of both the Hoyt analysis as well as the application of LIDAR relative to the Hoyt analysis. And uh, as a result of the, the additional work that you did, you had um, some, uh, some additional comments to make. As far as... That, that, you, that you acknowledge that you were, you were limited or given the information that we only use two points that is an acceptable uh, standard for the determination of ground uh, level. Uh, and then, but then second, if using uh, LIDAR analysis and then mapping that onto the Hoyt, although I don't require that you do that, one could potentially determine that the house is actually above the height limit. So it's kind of two separate questions. Comparing the LIDAR to the Hoyt survey, uh, I found those to be very consistent. I didn't see a big discrepancy. We were within, I believe, on average, one-tenth to two-tenths of a foot, uh, which that's pretty accurate for comparing somebody taking the measurements on the ground, bringing it through contouring, versus taking the measurements from an airplane connected to a satellite and projecting the impulses from the radar down onto the uh, laser scanner down onto the surface. 
So, so those two returns are actually very consistent and they don't indicate that the Hoyt measurements are wrong or that the LIDAR measurements are wrong. They both kind of correspond and confirm each other. If it had been the precedent or the past practice within town to have a, say, a specific set of measurements, like I believe the ones that you presented to me were every four feet around the full 10 foot offset, um, that would result in a significantly lower mean pre-construction grade. Um, I believe that we were looking at a number as much as approximately two feet, maybe even two and a half feet, depending on uh, which uh, numbers we were using. It was roughly two feet. Um, so yes, if we were to take numerous points at incremental distances around that 10 foot offset, we would come up with a lower pre-construction grade that would result in a higher building height. Thank you very much. And um, you've confirmed uh, one thing in particular, which is that um, taking more measurements gives you greater accuracy. Um, uh, at least it gives you a, a, a more defensible analysis because you're dealing with the actual surface conditions. So here we are faced with a dilemma. And I can only do the following, which is to ask a member of the planning board based on this discussion to make a motion about uh, what we shall do in relationship to the current project proposed for 580 Jerusalem Road, which is currently under construction. And I would ask somebody to make a motion. Uh, before that, um... Um, Paul Collier is going to vote because our other member is missing, right? That is correct. Madam Chair, do you want to hear from the public or do you want to? Well, we did hear from they the did. public. The first, we did oh, hear from them. Oh, I didn't know if they could physically speak in the meeting or if it just had to go through the Q&A. Excuse me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, Jen, do we have both capabilities? Uh, we sit, don't generally don't do that for the guidance of um, IT. We sometimes do it in smaller, but the two people that did speak did do the Q&A. So we did read those aloud. But in the future, if we want to, we can. We just have to be a little bit careful. Okay. So so at this point, if that's the mechanism upon, I, I, I somehow thought that might be what was happening. Um, uh, then we need to move to the question. And I need somebody to make a motion. Uh, I'll make a motion. Um, we, 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 can have, we can do two things. We can approve the application as is, or we can approve the application with conditions. So I'll make a motion that we approve the application for large home review with the condition that they go before the Zoning Board of Appeals for a determination on height being compliant with zoning. All right, thank you. So what I will do is I will call people alphabetically. You need a second. You need to you know, try and get a second. I just, I just want to, I want to first just set the rules, which is we're going to go by alphabetical order and I will ask each individual to state their name and their vote. So with that, can I get a second? Can I second? I second the motion. May I do that? Of course. Yep. All right. Like, uh, let's begin um, then the vote. Clark Brewer. Clark Brewer votes aye. Tom Callahan. Tom Callahan votes no. Can you say it again? Nay, no. Opposed. Okay. Paul Collieri. Paul Collieri opposed. Eric Potter. Eric Potter opposed. Amy Glassmeyer, aye. The, pass. the motion fails to pass. So we will return to the second. Can I have you restate the motion? I'll make, I'll make the motion that we approve it as presented. Approve a large home review as presented. Uh, can I have a second, please? I'll second. Eric Potter seconds. All right, so we're gonna do roll call again. Clark Brewer. Clark Brewer, nay. 
Tom Callahan. Tom Callahan, aye. Paul Kaliri. Paul Kaliri, aye. Amy Glassmeyer, no. Eric Potter. I second it, so I, I would aye. It passes on a vote of uh, three to two in favor of um, uh, passing the uh, large house review on the part of the 580 Jerusalem Road project. That's kind of an exciting vote. We don't usually get those. So thank you, everyone. This was, um, and it was, it was, it was an discussion. enthusiastic yes for me, by the way. So. Um, so we said we would do this for the sake of everyone involved. We're going to take a 10 minute break so that people can just sort of change the mood and get something to drink and do everything else. So we'll catch you back at 825. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. entertain that uh, and then um, we will wrap it up and I will ask Lauren to get us started and then um, we will move forward on that. Is that okay with everybody? That was okay. good. Good. Thank you very much. All right. We must have about 36 seconds before it all starts again. Let's hope that Mr. Potter has not moved too far away from the computer. What's the temperature down there, Eve? About 90? Very hot and humid. I can't go for a run past eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> That's, what does that say? All righty. I'm gonna begin. Uh, good, e good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, members of the, the public, as well as the members of the uh, applicants, the planning board members, our very kind staff, uh, and others. Um, this is the second part of the uh, Cohasset Planning Board meeting of October 14th. We're opening up the second part of the here. Uh, we're opening up the second hearing at 8:30 p.m. Um, I would like to uh, uh, first off recognize our two um, amazing uh, colleagues, uh, Jen Oram, who is the Assistant Director for uh, Planning, Zoning, and Permits, uh, and uh, Lauren Lind, who is the Director of Planning. Then I would, uh, as I would also recognize Karis North, who is our Council. Uh, Eve uh, Tapper, who is our um, special planner um, on behalf of the town for the Harbor Overlay Plan project. I hope I'm not missing anybody. I will now call roll for the planning board members, beginning alphabetically with Clark Brewer. Clark Brewer, here. Tom Callahan. Tom Callahan is here. Paul Kaliri. Paul Kaliri here. Eric Potter. Eric Potter here. Amy Glassmeyer here. Um, we will begin with the applicant's presentation and, and then we will move to our peer review. Um, and I understand Mr. Goldridge will start the conversation and then we'll pass it to colleagues of his. Good evening, Madam Chair. Thank you for seeing us and hearing us tonight. Uh, we're continuing the hearing on the proposed project at the harbor. Tonight, we'll have our, our consultants, Cavanero, John Cavanero, go through the changes that we have made to the plans that were submitted to the planning board uh, on September 30th. To highlight just a couple of the changes that we've made, uh, we've actually reduced the unit count from 29 to 23. We've eliminated the underground parking garage Parking is now in the building, totally shielded from the street on the first level. We've eliminated a portion of the building along Margin Street that was considered by some to be sticking out on the view corridor, so we pulled that back. Um, and we've expanded some of the commercial retail non-residential space 
even though the square footage has changed from the reduction of units, we've actually increased slightly the commercial square footage. The changes that we've made were based on the input we received from the planning board, as well as from the peer reviewers. So I'd like to turn over to John Cavanero to walk through these individually with the board. Thank you very much. Mr. Cavanaro. Thank you, George. Uh, good evening, members of the board, um, colleagues of the board. What I'm going to do is pull up the site plans that were submitted on September 30th, as George mentioned. This is our fourth hearing with the board. And uh, since our last meeting on August 26th, there were some design changes to the application, uh, principally to address all of the review comments that we had received to date, both from peer review, the board, the public, and really the, the three principal areas that we're focus on, fo focusing on were to make the project more compliant as it related to parking configuration and aisle width, to make the maintain and uh, enhance the vibrancy of the project uh, by focusing on the right sizing of the non-residential space, uh, as well as, as George articulated on, maintaining that important view corridor, uh, looking at the actual alignment of the building. And third, to make the project more sustainable um, and looking at the overall project as it related to the underground parking and the levels of the, of the non-residential space, specifically at 124. Uh, the consideration was made to end up moving from the first floor uh, residential units at 124 and instead elevating the covered parking from subgrade to uh, at grade. Uh, what that does, it, it addresses long-term planning as it relates to climate change and maintains the, the improvements for stormwater management um, by covering, keeping covered parking uh, at both uh, 124 and 87L. So uh, on September 30th, we did submit uh, a response to the last review comments that we received to date. And we updated the site plans to uh, reflect the changes, uh, some of which George touched upon, but I'll just walk through them individually. Uh, primarily in order to really focus on making the project more compliant as it relates to parking, what we needed to do is to reevaluate the actual number of units. And uh, because really the only way to make all of the spaces conforming under a roof and uh, sited on the property was to reduce the unit count. So that was done by over 30%, as George mentioned, uh, at the 124 site from 19 to 13. Uh, and also to reduce the overall gross square, fo uh, square footage by about over a little over 20% uh, by knocking off about 11,000 square feet of uh, gross floor area. Elevating the covered parking uh, ended up eliminating the ground level units at 124. Um, and what we ended up doing was as part of that, uh, being able to right size and maintain all conforming spaces. Another thing that we did uh, since the last plan set was in response to the peer review comments, we added additional uh, existing condition detail to the existing condition site plan, uh, including existing utilities, uh, some ad additional coverage within the Elm Street, Border Street, and Margin Street view corridor, um, corridors themselves, expanded uh, the survey coverage also to the west. So with the parking, um, by making this, eliminating that ground floor and reducing the unit count, what we ended up doing was we're able to re reallocate the parking inside the building, reduce the, the footprint um, from what it was slightly, and, and also make it changes so that we could maintain a 24-foot drive aisle and keep all of the parking spaces conforming in, spa in size. Within the, the covered parking for 124, we maintain 23 spaces and one ADA accessible space. Uh, on the exterior, we maintain 21 spaces, additionally with one accessible space. So the goal here was to maintain access to at least the number of existing 
spaces that fall on the municipal land. Even though the, the irregular property line, as you may recall, prohibits really both parties, private and public, from accessing these spaces, uh, this will be something that will be worked out in the future between the owner and the town. But what we wanted to do is to maintain that minimum space count uh, accessible to the town lot, which was 17 to start with. We've added uh, a few spaces uh, within this uh, lot corridor. So we've got 21 spaces on the exterior with one accessible, 23 spaces in the interior with one accessible on the 124 side. Over on 87, we maintained uh, the same unit count and just under a thousand square feet of non-residential space, but we ended up re-spacing and resizing all of the interior parking spaces and exterior spaces to additionally allow for that minimum aisle width and minimum um, conforming space dimension, both length and width. Again, we also have an, an, an accessible space to fall within the ADA count of under 25 spaces were required to have one ADA accessible space. George also talked about um, resizing both the non-residential um, space as well as some portions of the main building. And that was in an effort to maintain and enlarge uh, the view corridor on that northerly side along Margin Street before we had uh, some minor conflicts with the de outdoor decking and the building itself protruded uh, in the northerly direction. So that was modified. Uh, also, we made a change to the on-street uh, parking by eliminating the spaces that were sited along Margin Street. Also, that was raised as a potential conflict with the view corridor, um, but also uh, tried to repurpose that as a loading area. Uh, that was also brought up as a, a comment on multiple occasions. So we're, we're maintaining a loading area adjacent to the non-residential space and the sidewalk. Um, and because we're, we really have limited area elsewhere to do that, uh, and we wanted to open that up. So we were able to repurpose, again, by reducing the unit count and the square footage, we were able to get the parking count to, to maintain within the buildings and, and also the exterior. The one other thing that was raised on multiple occasions was the location of the curb cut at 124 Elm. Just as a reminder, we're actually eliminating three curb openings, reducing from four down to one curb opening, which is a real enhancement in terms of traffic management because it reduces all the conflict points um, that are less controlled. So we're maintaining that single entry point into the interior parking and also the ex exterior parking. But if you remember, the original plan had the curb opening from its existing position shifted to the southeast, uh, entering essentially where the existing parking spaces are located. And we're re relocating the parking spaces in that area. What that did was it it provided um, less stopping site distance looking in the southeasterly direction towards Border Street. So we ended up relocating that, shifting it back to its original position in the northwesterly direction, which maintains the existing stopping site distance um, with the existing curb opening. One other thing, in addition to eliminating the uh, non-conforming spaces within both, both sides of the street. We also eliminated the tandem parking, uh, which, which is not explicitly called out as prohibited, but it's, it's not something that um, is preferred naturally. So we were able to eliminate that again by reducing the unit count. As well as uh, making these changes to the site plan, um, we also submitted updated architectural plans, updated landscape architecture plans. We revised the stormwater management calculations, including subcatchment area plans. We also uh, added an erosion control and sedimentation control plan and added details uh, that were requested uh, through the peer review. We're still maintaining 
um, an improvement in stormwater management, both in quality and rate and volume by uh, reducing the overall impervious and putting the, the parking under roof, which is a real benefit in terms of water quality. Uh, it eliminates that potential mix of pollutants with stormwater. As I mentioned, we added details to conform with the peer review review uh, request, and we added a strong, an erosion control plan to address uh, issues that happened during construction, adding construction entrances at both sides of the street, uh, as well as uh, erosion and control notes on the, on the plan itself. Another thing that we did was we staked out the building footprint at 124, uh, what it does is it, it matches as many points as we could with the proposed building corners of both the north and south building at 124. But as you can imagine, it runs into that existing building that runs across the site. So we ended the points uh, where we could uh, to give as much of, a, of an outline of the proposed building as possible. And I believe a, a stakeout sketch was provided as well to the board. So with that, that summarizes the changes that we made to the site plan. I am going to hand that off to Adam and Adam will talk a little bit about zoning compliance and other regulatory matters. John, thank you very much and good thank evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll try and be brief. It's been a, a long evening. Uh, I was just asked to speak to the waivers, which have obviously changed as a result of the design guidelines. And so I'll very, be very brief. Um, we're no longer seeking a waiver from the requirements of Section 322.6b.1, which relates to the 15% of non-residential because we're no longer proposing ground floor dwelling units, which is the trigger for that request. Um, and as John mentioned, the parking for the building now complies with the uh, parking space size and drive aisle dimensions and are conforming. So we no longer need that waiver. Uh, we are proposing to maintain the existing non-conforming parking spaces and drive aisles in the town parking lot and just expanding that slightly um, to add several spaces, uh, spaces excuse me, um, which extends those non-conforming conditions. Um, there was some suggestion by the peer review consultants that that activity would require compliance with the dimensional requirements that we'd have to bring the town parking lot into compliance and we have a respectful disagreement regarding that. Uh, we don't believe that that zoning provision uh, would apply to a parking lot as opposed to a building structure. But even if you did, if you took a careful reading of the zoning bylaw, um, uh, all that that section 371 would require would be compliance with the table of street parking standards, the number of parking spaces. Um, so if there was an activity that required uh, uh, triggered compliance with 371, you'd simply have to provide the number of parking spaces. The actual parking standards and dimensions are in another section of the zoning bylaws at uh, 307.3. And so we have a respectful disagreement regarding that. I, I would remind the planning board that it is the special permit granting authority within the HBVOD. And you have the ability to grant a special permit to extend an existing non-conforming condition pursuant to section 308.7 of the zoning bylaws. So very briefly, with respect to waivers, they're fairly uh, minor. Um, uh, one, uh, as you remember, we have reduced uh, the number of commercial parking spaces pursuant to section 322.7. And we are uh, requesting uh, minor waivers from the HBVOD design guidelines uh, with respect to two items. One, the temporary loading space at 87 Elm Street, uh, which cannot be screened and the designated loading space for 124 Elm Street, located adjacent to Margin Street, which John has uh, suggested. 
And as you like to know, um, you are allowed to waive your design guidelines under section 3.5 of the design uh, guidelines. Uh, I, I would uh, just briefly like to speak to the question of easements uh, simply because uh, I think there's is a bit of confusion regarding that issue. Um, and I, I wanted to assure the board that public access to the site is going to be assured through the chapter 91 licensing process. As you know, this property is within chapter 91 jurisdiction. We're actually required to have a public access, public walkway network uh, pursuant to section 310 CMR 9.52 of the chapter 91 regulations. Uh, we're going to propose to DEP that that include not only the captain's walk, the 10 foot wide walk along the shoreline, but also the public park, the public components that were proposed. Uh, we anticipate that that will be all part of the chapter 91 license, which assures public access consistent with state regulations. And that eliminates the need for private easements. So I just want to assure the board that those public access components are going to be assured by compliance with chapter 91. And there's no uh, requirement under those circumstances to have private grants of easement with respect to public access. And so those are the points that uh, I want to make. And so I'm happy to turn this uh, back over to George and Ted, if there's a, I believe to speak to the affordable housing issue. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Madam Chair, regarding the affordable housing requirement for the project, as we mentioned in our last hearing, we have <clears throat> taken the step of going a little further than what the requirement is in terms of looking for and trying to find solutions for the affordable housing as opposed to just sending a check to the affordable housing steering committee. In meetings with both the steering committee and the affordable housing trust, they have explained to us and I believe that they have also forwarded a letter to the planning board that their number one goal is to increase the unit count of subsidized housing for the subsidized housing inventory. With that goal in mind, we have already identified a number of opportunities for us in order to increase the count. We have a requirement of increasing the count by three, three units. Um, we have some opportunities perhaps, depending on timing, to do even better than that. You had asked Madam Chair last time for some specificity in terms of what units would be uh, enrolled within the SHI. And unfortunately, because we don't have a permit yet, we can't go out and acquire properties or build properties yet. So we're, we're going to ask obviously that as a condition of the permit, if you so see it, that we are required to have the minimum of three units applied towards the subsidized housing inventory for the town that can be approved by the planning board and or the Affordable Housing Trust and the Affordable Housing Steering Committee. As an example of some of the opportunities that we have, one of them is on the market. We probably won't be able to get it because it's on the market now and someone else might likely take it up, but there's a five unit opportunity near downtown that could be deed restricted. That appears to be the, the quickest way to get units on the count is to have existing units deed restricted. As you know, we're also talking to uh, the town regarding 808 Jerusalem Road, that the RFP is coming out. We have a, an understanding with um, Habitat to potentially partner with them, if that's one of the opportunities. There are other land parcels in town that the town owns. That of course would have to go back to town meeting. So that's probably the longest lead time. So to summarize, our goal is to try to get a minimum of three units somewhere in town that is approved by the planning board and the affordable housing trust and steering committee prior to the certificate of occupancy for our project. I believe now that's the extent of our comments for this evening, pending discussions with the peer review and the planning board. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very nice, compact presentation and, and uh, very easy to follow as well as to take notes from. Uh, so let's uh, turn to the peer reviews.
Oh, yes, before before the peer review, excuse me, um, were, were you going to um, do a presentation on the architectural drawings, the revised architectural drawings? Yes, we, we can do that now. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you for changing that. Uh, Lauren, if you could let Herrera uh, in as a panelist. Sorry, could you repeat that name? It's, uh, he's under H. P A N D Y A at Nelson. Ah, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. And also, if you can, Lauren, add uh, Peter Habib. He's also on the call. Certainly. Thank you. Of course, I couldn't say anything until I got on. So. <laughs> So Peter can bring up or present the, um, the PDF packet if you can share a screen. Yep, one second. So Madam Chair on the board, this is the, uh, the plan that we just went over. Uh, that John actually uh, went over just a few moments ago. So again, this is just placing the the project and the and the first floor plan uh, on the site, just showing the fact that the first floor plan does indicate that the parking is within that uh, ground floor, and also indicating the uh, the the additional parking. So these essentially just uh, communicate with each other. You can go to the next one, Pete. <clears throat> So these just keep going down, just go to the architectural. Yes. So from an architectural drawing. Uh, Can I ask a question? Could, do you have an overview visual that sort of gives you a context that actually shows the, the sort of pr preliminary physical form of the site just because it'll motivate how we think about it? Uh, Madam Chair, do you mean an aerial view or a site no, no, plan? No, simply that rather than seeing a schematic is to actually see um, the, the derived imagery of what you imagine the project to look like. So that would be the three-dimensional, I think, Peter. Yeah, give me one sec. Let me it's pull really it the picture, the pretty picture. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I don't know how else to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> one second, we're just going to pull that one right up. Stop sharing for one sec while I go grab that. Yeah, we do have some images that actually um, demonstrate the view corridor and um, just sort of the overall look, which we still believe to be quite an attractive look for the uh, the area. So we're excited about that. I'm also curious to learn about that whoopie pie recipe. By the way, that was uh, <laughs> maybe we should have a contest. <laughs> I was like, that, that was the highlight. <laughs> Excuse us one more second. I wish we had some music to play in the background. Probably everyone has done at least three Zooms today, so. Oh, it's at a minimum. <laughs> hey, Harrell, I can pull mine up if it's. Oh, you have it? Okay. Yeah, would you mind, Ted? Sorry. Pete, would that be helpful? Yeah, that'd be great, Ted, if you have it. Sorry. Thank you, Ted. All right, so Harrell, just let me know. Yep. So we'll just jump to the 3D. So, I mean, the overall look and feel is still the same, but I guess this is probably the more demonstrative view that we were talking about that John had referred to by pulling back the deck. And I guess, Ted, since you're, um, although I think, oh no, I can't annotate in this particular Zoom. 
but you can see that the view quarters with that deck pulled back, you have a lot more visibility uh, to the water's edge. Um, so demonstratively, I think that's a much wider aperture than we had before. So I think that's one of the improvements um, that that's there. And as you can also tell that, you know, the goal is to not make it feel like, um, you know, the ground floor is parking. So we're still trying to make sure it feels very uh, architectural um, and in keeping with the sort of original intent of the building. So that too is also, um, you know, part of the overall look and feel. So Ted, you can go to the next slide, please. One thing just to highlight on this is we've maintained the residential entries. Correct. Um, on here. So there are a series of these they are now shared entries. So um, each unit will share or two units will share an entry. And this is from the public parking lot looking at is of course the two garage entrances are still there are openings into the building for the, um, the parking but then just sort of the landscape quality the open quality of the uh, the public space that uh, John was talking to and Adam was referring to in the uh, chapter 91 component on the right hand side And this is more from the, the waters you looking back up again, trying to maintain that view. you can kind of see on the right hand side, uh, the view to the actual road again, just demonstrating the fact that that component of the project was uh, cut back to the left. So increasing the aperture. And then across the way, just up the, on the other side of it, um, again, the two, pro the two sides of the street, just, you know, communicative in its uh, design intent. with some of the lower portion being a non-residential use. And that's that's sort of, uh, Madam Chair, sort of the uh, the highlights. Uh, sort Perfect, of that sets the context. Spinning around the building. So in, in many ways, uh, little to no change uh, to the visible eye from that perspective. The, uh, the landscape architecture Yes. Got Mark. Mark on that. Mark, do you want to share the landscape plan? Sure. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yep. All right. So, you seen the plan? Yes. So, the plan, the, the basis of the plan has not changed very much. Um, we are, uh, we still are showing the sort of public park located here. Um, sort of a continuation of the view corridor. Um, the terrace decks, the uh, harbor walk is located here. There's still, uh, the lawn is indicated. We've changed the slope of this lawn so that the uh, handrails are removed now. So this is just a path that crosses the lawn space. The residential courtyard um, is roughly the same uh, size. We're currently showing it with a, a sort of small pool um, that's included as part of the private amenities. Uh, and um, we're showing uh, tree plantings within the property line um, as, as it sort of fits within the front yard spaces. Um, really the uh, project over at 83 Elm has not changed substantively in terms of the landscape um, with sort of vegetation along this edge and parking as was previously shown by John. So the, the revised set also has, so that's the rendered plan. Um, we also have um, the site plan, which shows the planting in a little bit more detail, the grading plan. Um, and the, the planting plan. I'm sorry, can you just describe like some of the, like the hardscapes um, that are a part of the, part of the plan? Sure, so um, there is the, the street and the public sidewalk. Um, there is a sidewalk proposed um, to allow people to get out of their vehicle along this edge here with a hedge that prevents when people are sitting on the lawn, the, having a hedge along this edge stops you from looking into the parking lot and seeing all the vehicles and seeing under the parking lot if you're sitting on the grass. 
And the idea of this hedge is that it follows around the perimeter of um, the sort of park parcel. There's a low hedge here that separates the sort of eating zone, um, sitting zone from this zone of the park. Uh, the trees have all been moved clearly out of the view corridor. There's two uh, canopy trees located here to sort of make the edge of that space. Um, a couple of trees planted also along this edge or zone between the parking zone and the building. Um, a few understory trees, small, uh, sort of tall shrubs within the sort of courtyard space. They uh, move to sort of slightly larger trees in the space between the two buildings. Um, and then, as I said before, there are these sort of um, understory trees, smaller scale trees along the back of sidewalk where there's actually like enough soil medium for trees to grow. And that's, that's pretty much the extent of the planting. Is there any consideration when given to how other boards may approve of a, the plan that comes before them with regards to landscaping, uh, specifically, let's say CONCOM? with regards to the 50 foot buffer, let's say, um, on the, and whether or not they'll allow for grass or lawn to be there or, or certain plantings and, and such. Because I think that um, would be something maybe to get ahead of if it's, uh, if it's something that hasn't been thought of or maybe it already has and we, we, we can just be filled in. Well, I think overall, Eric, we, we will be submitting a notice of intent to the Conservation Commission, but in most cases, what we're doing is removing impervious. In the case of 124, we're taking a building completely out of the 50 and replacing it mostly with vegetation, pulling the buildings back. But um, it, it is an important point and they will want to know specifically about plant selection, salt tolerance. Um, but I think overall, the, the, the spirit of this project is really to pull things away from the harbor at 124 and um, really to, to put right now what's a, an uncovered parking area at 87 uh, under a roof and adding some, some crushed stone at the back end of that building. But um, certainly in any this plus um, some more dialogue will take place with the Conservation Commission. And John, this is Adam. Go ahead. Um, sorry, Madam Chair. I, I was going to add that the Wetland resources here are coastal wetland resources, land underwater. We're not dealing with vegetated wetlands where you typically find a vegetated buffer zone. Uh, and so it's a slightly different analysis given these coastal resource areas rather than inland wetland resources such as bordering vegetated wetlands or isolated vegetated wetlands. So I just remind the board of that distinction. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Thank you, and, and I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, in terms of the surface for the parking areas, there's no way to tell from the image here if that's blacktop or whether that's some sort of brick material, something that has a kind of visually appealing surface, but also is capable of handling the, the coming and going of cars. Is there any consideration for that? So what is gonna be the blacktop for the parking? It will essentially mirror what's there today. It'll be replaced with bituminous concrete so at, at 124. Something else that would be both um, aesthetically more compelling and durable and also uh, capable of allowing, you know, water to essentially seep in. What we're, what we're trying, we're actually reducing, we're improving stormwater conditions at both sides. I understand sites. that, but I'm, I'm thinking aesthetically speaking, that's an, that aperture right there is like this entryway to the entire project. And it's gonna be the place that, that both the people who live there, but importantly, people who don't live there actually see the space. And if the space has a feeling that is softer and, and less you know, street-like and more uh, having it sort of blend into being something that might be considered more uh, accommodating of, of peacefulness. I'm just asking that question. Have you thought about material options for that space? Not beyond replacing it with in-kind bituminous concrete. Okay, great. Thank you.
So, Madam Chair, I believe then uh, this concludes our presentation. A small Unless intervention. Is I, I believe that Eve Tapper, our um, consulting planner, would like to make a comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to follow up on Mr. Potter's question about um, whether CONCOM would require something different than or more information on the plantings. And this comes up in every, every time that the, a particular project has to go to more than one board. Generally, it, you know, it's, it, every, towns do it differently, but generally um, it should go to the planning board first because your approval is discretionary and you have the most uh, to say about the site plan. And so if they went to another board, say the CONCOM first and CONCOM required a particular um, set of plantings in a particular um, location and then they came to the planning board and the planning board wanted a different site plan for a variety of different reasons, uh, then they'd have to go back to CONCOM again. And CONCOM is a little bit more black and white than the planning board. The planning board has discretion. It has to make particular findings, which can be made either way. My understanding, and I, and I don't staff CONCOM, but my understanding of CONCOM a little bit is show us what the alternatives are and you know, meet the requirements. And there are lots of different ways to meet those requirements. So once the planning board has set what they want the site plan to look like, then going to CONCOM is a little bit easier. That being said, if CONCOM it has a major problem that hasn't been um, addressed, it could still come back to the planning board because one of the conditions and the number one condition that is almost always put into these kinds of proposals for the, um, in the decision is it must be built as it was shown to the planning board and as we approved it. So if they have to make changes and it can't be built in that manner, they're going to have to come back to the planning board for some site plan review and additional amendments. But usually it's better to have the, the board that's looking at the overall picture go first and then go to the other boards. Um, and so I know that has been a question among the board members as this has gone forward. Um, and they, the, this board does not have jurisdiction over some of the things that CONCOM has, but when, when if, you, if you agree to a particular site plan, CONCOM can usually work within those parameters. So I just wanted to mention that. Does the site plan include the only, not only the building, but the entire, um, the entire, the, the, the entire lot, meaning the open space and, and yes. you know, as well? Yes, so, and parking and the like. So, I mean, it may not, um, they may want to change the, the plantings for a particular reason. And if, it, and if, say, there was a particular tree that the planning board really wanted um, and had a particular reason as to why they really wanted that tree, if that tree has to be moved because CONCOM doesn't allow it, then you'd come back. But in general, you want to see plantings and CONCOM can get more into the details of which plantings are appropriate. Um, and, uh, but the site plan itself, you know, has to look the way that you want it. And since you have the, the planning board has the most discretion with regard to that, it makes the process move more, move more, uh, move better um, and more consistently if the parameters are set by the board with the most jurisdiction and then we go downwards. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so let me ask for, to the applicant, Mr. McGoldrich, are you ready to pass the baton to the peer review? Yes, we are. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, uh, Lauren, would you please introduce our peer review? Certainly. Thank you. I will introduce Darren Kirkjian, Jim Riordan, and Jeff Santacruci, our team from Weston and Sampson for the peer review section. So good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you to the applicant. Um, I'm going to just share my screen here. And hopefully that will work. Um, so as uh, Lauren mentioned, we have Jim Reardon, our uh, senior technical lead, and Jeff Santa Cruz on the call from our peer review team. Uh, Jeff serves as our senior traffic engineer. Um, I'll kind of run through these fairly quickly to save some time. Um, our review criteria, um, as has been mentioned, is the site plan and special uh, permit application. Uh, just highlighting the most recent items that the applicant has also raised was the last hearing on August 26th. Um, we did have that revised applicant document package with significant changes to 124 Elm Street that we've reviewed. 
Um, and then subsequently last week we provided uh, a memo uh, with and then received responses to that yesterday um, that we have also are in the process of reviewing. Uh, looking at uh, our overall review topics for today's presentation, uh, those follow from our previous memos from July 22nd and August 21st um, that were basically all seven topics that we've previously reviewed, um, we've revisited except for um, item three, um, actually item two with the bylaw compliance uh, because the elimination of the ground floor uh, residential no longer applies. Uh, so for today we'll be highlighting um, our significant findings we want to um, provide in the beginning of our presentation and those include building height um, considerations, parking allocation, traffic, and uh, the public park in the HVBOD guidelines as they relate to landscaping. Um, and we did just want to note, as we've noted before, the applicant may have identified uh, solutions to some of these concerns, um, which uh, they, they raised actually this evening. Uh, so the first item just to, to go over is the flat roof area um, and building height. Um, in yellow here, we've taken from this uh, applicant's drawings, uh, locations of site plans or locations of flat roofs. Uh, the gray locations are sloped roofs. Um, those are also shown in the renderings. Um, generally from the street, um, if you're seeing just the slope roof, not the flat roof areas, those are screened with the slope roof. Um, they also screen uh, HVAC equipment and provide sound isolation, so there are benefits of the design. Uh, however, just a review of the bylaws um, and the HVBOD guidelines um, have requirements for the height of both flat roofs and slope, roof, slope roofs that differ. And as such, we recommend the applicant consider a waiver for the flat roof areas, um, which may be in front of the zoning board. Uh, so looking at the section here and not to get into, um, and we certainly can get into all the, the, the numbers in, in greater detail, but the base flood elevation serves as the uh, ground uh, measurement at uh, 10 feet um, that the applicant can then go up to 35 feet above that, which is 45 feet. Um, so the slope roofs, again, are in conformance with the bylaws. We have no issues with that. The flat, the flat roof areas, however, um, as shown on this section, um, are at that same max height of 45 feet. Um, they are, as I noted, uh, screening uh, HVAC equipment and providing noise isolation, so they do provide a benefit. Uh, however, this um, hybrid approach doesn't have an exact match in the HVBOD guidelines. Um, and another item that we had noted is the South Building at 124 uh, Elm Street has a, a portion of flat roof that doesn't appear to be screened. Um, generally, the HVBOD guidelines require a parapet or railing as an edge. Um, and in this case, we recommend that a similar uh, railing or, um, or parapet are provided for this flat roof that would be otherwise visible from the public park area. Uh, so then in summary for the building height, um, as I've mentioned, the sloped height the, or the sloped roof elements um, conform to the bylaws. Uh, the flat roof elements, we understand the different, difference of interpretation potentially with the applicant um, on the exact elevation that is required there. Um, so, and just as clarification, the flat roof on 87 Elm Street is at 44 feet. Uh, it's at 45 feet at 124 Elm Street. Um, and it's just that HVBOD guideline that both discourages the use of flat roofs and if they are placed requires uh, a parapet or a railing. In this case, it, neither a parapet or railing are present. However, there is uh, the screening, the edge that's provided is the actual ridge line at 50 feet, um, which in this case, we've again recommended that the applicant consider a waiver or variance. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll shift over to Jeff and I'll be advancing the slides. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I took a look again, the applicant provided some additional information with the change in the units. I just would like to mention that, um, as noted previously, a traffic study was prepared for this project. Uh, that was prepared in uh, conformance with MassDOT's and general engineering practices of the industry. Uh, with the change in the units to a lower value, this study would now be somewhat conservative on the trip generation characteristics of the site and the operation of driveways and intersections around it as it would be a lower traffic volume. But on a parking standpoint, um, the lower um, units does require a smaller amount of spaces, both uh, on the residential piece. What we did note was that there is an actual um, four 
space um, surplus on lot 124 of uh, private residential parking. Uh, as there is no change on the Elm Street, um, the parking provided is what's required under the standard. Under the non-residential parking for the uh, 124 site, there is actually two space that they are shy from the standard uh, and the calculations that were provided. But we noted that on 87 Elm Street, there is actually a surplus of two spaces. So for the overall project, there is a net zero um, parking, two plus on one site, two minus on the other. Given that the two sites are so close together, uh, we are comfortable uh, that this kind of meets the general guidance of the bylaw, why each property may have a plus and a minus, overall the development would meet it, but we still suggest that they do uh, seek the waiver from, uh, from the park on 124 Elm Street, but we don't see this as a, a negative to the overall site. But if you could forward it on, Darren. This is just a general layout of the interior showing all the residential spaces. Go ahead, you can forward. The one thing we did note, um, and it seems to be there's a little difference of opinion on the um, requirements of ADA parking. The way we had um, looked at this was that the resident, the parking on the parcel was separate than the parking on the town portion. So that based on the bylaws, the required spaces of ADA accessible um, compliant on 124 would actually be need to be two spaces based on the, the quantity and that the town lot itself would still maintain one. Um, the applicant has since kind of countered that. So there were some conversations they've had that indicate that the two is um, considered excess, uh, not accessible, excuse me, is acceptable based on looking at the entire uh, parking area between the town lot and the residential. Um, I would say we would still request to see some information on backup of who they had conversations with and how that uh, determination was made. If you could go ahead. Uh, from a traffic standpoint, um, the applicant has indicated that they're gonna be utilizing the existing driveway at the Veterans Park parking um, as the new entrance. It is noted that this entrance does not meet the minimum stopping site requirements uh, based on both MassDOT and AASHTO guidelines um, for safe operation. And uh, we would recommend that because this is a new use on the site, especially, you know, as the applicants indicated, they've closed all the other driveways. So all the traffic is now kind of concentrated at this one entrance that they should make efforts to uh, improve this access to meet the minimum standard of the 200 feet. Uh, in the previous submission, they had indicated that uh, there was consideration of providing a bump out, which would push the uh, nose of the vehicle out closer to the roadway and allow them to see further down uh, toward Board Street. And we would recommend that something along those lines still be considered or some other method by which the applicant and the town can come to agreement to improve the site distance at that location. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Hi, this is Jim Reardon. Uh, Darren introduced me earlier. I'm a senior project manager at Weston and Samson and um, providing uh, uh, technical uh, lead support on this project for anybody who doesn't happen to know me already. Um, so I'll be talking about the landscape architecture uh, review as well as affordable housing and then some additional comments that we had that didn't fit neatly into any particular topic, um, which we feel are, you know, uh, not necessarily the highlighted items, but uh, still quite important to address. So under landscape architecture, we have four areas uh, that uh, we had comments. And they include uh, walkways and lighting, which is in section 6.3 of our review memo, sidewalk and street plantings, section 6.4, uh, the public park, section 6.9, and then the pool, section 6.11. Next slide, please. First, the walkways and lighting. So uh, the HVBOD guidelines require uh, that designs show materials uh, for walkways. And um, the walkway running along the harbor 
uh, shows uh, lighting and materials. Um, however, the areas that are shown in the rectangles on this rendering uh, do not. So these sidewalks leading from the buildings down basically to the waterfront um, should also uh, show, show uh, should also include lighting and show materials. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, one last thing. Uh, and then uh, there are several parts of uh, the walkway where there is uh, asphalt repair being done. There's enough of the sidewalk repair patch that's being done that we think it would make sense to do an overall comprehensive repair. Next slide, please. Sidewalk and tree plantings. So, um, 87 Elm Street uh, doesn't include uh, trees, uh, the street trees or plantings as required in the HVBOD guidelines. You can see that in the rendering down below. Uh, you can also see in the rendering or the, um, the plan view in the upper left hand corner. Um, thanks. That the uh, existing trees, uh, that there are several existing trees, and these are proposed for removal. Um, you can uh, click on that again, please, Darren. Uh, but these are not necessarily being replaced in the uh, proposed plan. So we think that some some amount of trees should be uh, replaced for this uh, for this part of the project. Next slide, please. The public park, so landscaping for the public park uh, appears to be more or less typical of what, what we might expect for a uh, private residential landscaping um, as opposed to a uh, public park. We'd recommend a reduction in the number of hedges. We understand um, the purpose of the hedges is uh, to kind of separate the, uh, the park and demarcate it. Um, but uh, as you'll see in the next slide in, in just a moment, um, there are a couple of areas where we think hedges ought to be removed. Um, we'd also uh, like the applicant to consider some sort of visual markers of the public space, such as a gateway or entryway. So it's clarified that this is an area or a way into the public park. Some sort of benches or um, other sort of uh, sitting opportunities in the public uh, in the public park space might also be nice to encourage folks to use it uh, and when they enter to you know stay a little while so if we could go to the next slide please this is a rendering of the uh, of the area of the public park that we're talking about you can see these hedges um, are kind of uh, interrupting sort of the natural walking transition between parts of the public space. Um, we've included a little, uh, I don't know, emoji or whatever of uh, a bench on the right-hand side, uh, obviously enlarged. The idea here is to show approximately, you know, how you might like to include some sort of uh, uh, sitting opportunities for folks who might like to use the park. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the pool. So there's a private pool uh, abutting the public park that's been added recently. We think that's a nice addition. Um, we do have a little bit of concern about um, feeling of privacy or lack of feeling of privacy that uh, there might be in the current in the current sort of layout. Um, we might recommend that uh, a higher hedge wall uh, or some sort of screening uh, be included so that um, private users of the pool, um, you know, from the residents, uh, are not are having a you know a good level of privacy from folks who might be using the uh, the public area of the park. Next slide, please. So additional findings. We have a number of additional findings here. Uh, I'll go over each one of these uh, in a little more detail. Um, uh, this is a overall listing though. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, under 
under a couple of different uh, um, sort of general topics. The first one being bylaw compliance. We have screening of the ground level parking. So this uh, photo to the right shows the existing condition uh, with the vegetation that's present. Um, the current application does not show uh, a, a replacement of this, uh, of this vegetation. It'll just remain as it is. Uh, this has been grandfathered, I guess, from, um, from prior use. Uh, the vegetation for the HVBOD guidelines uh, actually requires a higher uh, level of screening, like taller uh, plantings to be included. And so we would recommend that these are replaced with taller plantings. Additionally, the, uh, the surface it, at lot 124, the parking surface area, um, it is in not the greatest condition currently in its existing condition. We'd recommend that this is repaved and striped uh, or restriped. Um, we think this will add essentially curb appeal for, for the project. So we think it's a good idea for the project as well as being something that we would recommend uh, on behalf of the town. Next slide, please. Site plan layout in the public realms. We have three items under here. Uh, the first being existing utilities. So there are existing utilities in the street and uh, this project includes proposals to connect to those utilities. Um, the current designs do not show uh, the size of the connections, the materials for connection or location, specific location um, where the interconnections will occur. The uh, applicant's plan should be updated to address that. The oil water separator that's proposed um, doesn't currently conform with Massachusetts public, uh, po excuse me, Massachusetts plumbing code. So uh, we would recommend that that is updated, of course. Um, the berm and curb detail. So there were a few abbreviations used in the detailed drawings. Um, wasn't entirely clear what those meant. And so we would like uh, those to be spelled out and clarified. Uh, and then also, um, the curb detail should be um, should be drawn in a way that shows uh, clear compliance with ADA requirements. Next slide, please. Pedestrian accommodation. So the connection to from excuse me to the Cohasset Cohasset Village. Uh, like uh, the applicant to consider inclusion of a crosswalk to connect the site uh, to the points north from. The, from the Elm Street area. And then uh, sidewalk width, clarify the minimum, um, clarify that the sidewalk meets the minimum requirements regarding ADA accessibility across the existing driveway uh, to lot 124. Uh, next slide, please. Signage for the ADA parking. So um, this is in regard to the ADA access at 87 Elm Street for the non-residential space. Uh, signage is needed to clearly show where the ADA uh, designated parking is, and then also to direct users to those ADA spaces. Next slide, please. Affordable housing. Uh, I know the applicant mentioned a few things about this, um, including that they had met with the Affordable Housing Trust and Steering Committee. Uh, understand that, or I understood that this meeting took place on uh, October the 5th. Um, so uh, some written response regarding uh, how that meeting went and uh, the specifics of what might've been decided or recommended out of that meeting would be helpful. Um, we'd remind the applicant that uh, there needs to be a provision for a plan of action units. I know that the, that the applicant's plan is to include these action units, so we're pleased to hear that. Um, and I understand, uh, we understand that they know uh, that the required number of units remains at three. So that's good also. Um, if for some reason the applicant chooses to um, pursue a fee in lieu of units, uh, the applicant must request authorization for the fee in lieu of 
from the planning board and then the planning board has the ultimate decision making authority or the ultimate determination in uh, how that calculation was done and whether it was appropriate. Next slide please. Uh, and that concludes our presentation. Uh, again, I'd like to uh, like to say that we appreciate the applicants updates and we uh, we think that they're good ones that they'll help uh, improve the overall application for this project. Thank you very much. Thank you on behalf of your um, firm. So let me ask in, uh, on behalf of the applicant and, and representatives of the applicant, if there's anything they would like to say further at this moment to um, essentially close the presentation of the applicant in the peer review, and then we will move on to planning board discussion and public comments. So Mr. McGoldrich, do you have further things you'd like to add? So Madam Chair, we, we believe tonight's discussion has addressed most if not all the issues and concerns raised by the board to date, as well as the peer reviewers. With the input from both the board and the peer review, Weston Sampson, we believe we've designed a project that checks all the boxes and meets and exceeds the criteria the town established in the Harbor Village rezoning, the master plan and the municipal Harbor plan. Our project does not seek significant waivers or variances, and it can be built with resiliency for the future. The project is smaller than what's allowed by zoning. It has more public space than what's required, and it has the backing of the abutters. Yimbies, we call them. Yes, in my backyard is what they're telling me. We're combining brick and mortar retail space with ample public park and we're opening up waterfront access. It's not been available to the public for generations. And we're partnering with local community-based uh, groups like CSCR and CMI. And with all this, we're bringing life and vibrancy down to an area that has not had it. The combination of interior commercial retail space and exterior kiosks and public park is what brings vibrancy for everyone in the town, regardless of what type of units or, or what type of retail that's there. It, 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 the project is something that anyone from one years old to 100 years old can come down and view now. We think this project is a keystone element for the desire to bring the village to the harbor. So it's been more than three years since this idea was first put forth to the town by another out of town developer. It's been a year and a half since 350 citizens overwhelmingly approved the rezoning of the Harbor Plan. And it's been at least 50 years since the neighborhood was changed with the construction of the existing hotel. So we asked the board to deliberate on the merits of the project that you have in front of you and to move forward towards an approval with conditions to satisfy the numerous minor elements that still have to be resolved. Thank you. Thank you very much for your summary comments. They were very complete. Um, uh, then let me just ask uh, for clarification, which is there'll be no discussion of any changes that are taking place in the commercial space within the project. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Uh, I, I guess I'm just um, trying to, uh, I feel like you've addressed uh, an enormous number of issues that have been raised in the last uh, three months since we've been meeting. And I was um, uh, trying to place in context then the pre-existing expectation of the use of space for sh commercial purposes. And in changing the configuration of the parking uh, and bringing it into the interior of the building on the ground level. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything about discussing the commercial um, aspects of the project. So with the change in the parking, we have not changed at all 
with the exception of adding about another 150 square feet for commercial space. So we've actually increased slightly the, the previous amount of retail commercial space. With the bricks and mortar, the space that's within the buildings, as well as the kiosks that are outside, we can facilitate between five and 10 different retail users down there. We believe that that is sufficient enough to meet the spirit of the bylaw in terms of bringing a mixed use project. And again, even though the park seems to have, doesn't have the weight that we think it does with the, with the board, we believe the half acre park is really what brings the vibrancy and what brings people down to the waterfront. The whole concept of this rezoning was to reopen and reintroduce the waterfront to the town. If you look at the site plan, we're, we've reduced significantly the area where there's an existing building to allow both travelers in cars and walking to now experience the water much sooner than having to go around the existing building. Uh, we do anticipate and we will have retail and commercial space, but based on exhaustive discussions with retail brokers and other and retailers in our own downtown with looking at numerous other towns uh, the concern that everyone has is the and the chamber of commerce in fact has weighed in i believe they sent a letter as well to the board the concern is having too much bricks and mortar space that would stay dark especially in an area like cohasset which is very very seasonal we're meeting the spirit of the bylaw by having retail and commercial space that can accommodate numerous different varied users. We're talking to potential tenants already. Uh, George, so, can you just remind the board so Clark, what the percentage is? Clark, Clark, can I please just um, let me just close this. I just wanted to give you a chance to, to provide us with an understanding of how your conceptualization has changed and expanded because it looked like something had happened, but you hadn't really articulated it yet. So now with that, I will change the, the conversation and move to the planning board members discussion. Is, I was, Clark Brewer is I was the just, first person. Yeah, I was just following up on, on your, your comment about the mixed use and commercial, because I, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure it was somewhere, but I don't think anyone said what the percentage is of uh, commercial space in the square footage. Uh, John Cavanero, can you address that? Sure. Um, well, by removing the dwelling units on the first floor, yeah. so we're not under the same obligation to provide the minimum 15%. I understand. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, read the, I read the bylaw. Yeah, so it depends on, I guess, percentage of floor area at 124, the building with which the commercial space is allocated, is that the, the percentage? Yeah, I'm just asking? wondering how it compares with uh, how the commercial space as a percentage of the overall building. So, <clears throat> or so the square over, footage of commercial space. Yeah, so the square footage of commercial is about 26, 2679, 2700 square feet not including the outdoor space, which is another 2,500 square feet, I believe. Okay. So at 180, at 124, in that 2,700 interior space over the ground area is about a little under 15%. Under the total building area, it's less than that. Right. Um, so over on the other side of the street, you get about a thousand feet and it's about a 12,000 square foot footprint. So that's about 8%. Uh, it gets less if you count up all the floors, but again, it's not clear even in the bylaw, what, what is the building area that when you have ground floor dwelling units, what are we measuring it to? So it, what, what's happened from this proposal, from the last proposal, the modification is that the square footage has gone up slightly, but the ground level dwelling units have been eliminated and the total number of units has been decreased as well as the total gross square, square footage. 
Thank you. So Clark, would you like to continue and, and lead the discussion of the planning board members? Well, um, you know, first I, I want to find out, are, are, we trying to, are we trying to close a public hearing tonight? That's not my understanding. I think okay. that what we were expecting is that we were going to collect the information that has been compiled, compiled by the developer as part of our uh, initial deliberations, we were going to clarify things. All right. So the goal, the goal for our planning board members is uh, to react to this new design and um, and provide comments. Does that does that make that sense? Is my understanding of the meeting. Okay. Then I'll, I'll try and keep it brief. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to say, um, you know, it, it the the change uh, in design seems like a practical one. Not having the um, uh, not having uh, underground uh, parking, it, it just seems like it makes sense. Um, <clears throat> uh, I did I did read some of the responses of the applicant to um, uh, to Weston and Sampson's uh, latest peer review, and it seems like they, they were trying to defer some of them. Some of them they may be able to actually uh, address, and I'd recommend that they do do so. Um, because I think we're one I want like just an example, the wayfinding signage. I think it's important that the the planning board sees the signage um, that you have in mind, and and it could be stop signs and no left turn signs, or uh, but you know a way uh, to establish policy for the use of the park would be uh, an important part of that signage package, um, and I think the the planning board would want to see that. Um, it, 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 as a part of the um, as a part of the application, um, let's see the 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 new uh, commercial space on the west side of 124. It looks like there's stairs that go up to to elevation 12 from uh, grade, which is elevation nine, and and I'm wondering how that works because it wouldn't comply to uh, handicap uh, access. Um, so I'd say, you look at that, you either got to put a ramp in, um, uh, a lift isn't great in that kind of location. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the architectural package wasn't talked about in great detail, but um, the, is there elevator access from the parking level up to the, the, the units above? And are those... Um, I don't know if there's, there, I don't know if for, it, it looks, I can't tell. Can you give us cut sheets on those? Because um, uh, it, it looks like they might be like, like one per unit as opposed to hallways. I, I'd like some more information on that um, vertical, vertical access. <clears throat> I think it's going to be important that um, you have at least a, a draft as a part of your package for a homeowners association, as well as the commercial space association, just because it is a mixed use project, these uses do um, uh, tend to conflict. Uh, and it's, it's important that both of them can stand on, on firm ground <clears throat> with a, a, a set of set of rules that are, that the planning board understands um, before um, we approve um, we probably want to get sound data on your HVAC units. Um, I would expect you to have to do coastal windows. If you could um, uh, note that. Um, it, the, the hardscape plan, the, the landscape plan is a little generic. I think the, the peer review did, um, did bring that up. Um, uh, all in all, I think it's, it's, um, it's still an exciting project. Uh, I like the changes. Um, <clears throat> I still don't understand why there's a there's um, uh, a hardscape walkway right through the lawn. But um, you know, to me, it's if if there's a good reason for it, I'm I'm uh, I'm okay with that. Um, I can comment quickly on that one, Clark, because we didn't at the last meeting, and you brought it up. That's right. It's to, pro it's to provide ac an accessible path from that ADA space in the town lot to the non-residential space. Sure, sure. I, I understand. Um, generally, they like the, 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 click, the quickest, straightest route. 
um, but where you did have a, a handicap ramp on the on the north side um, to the commercial space, it seemed like that would be adequate as well. Um, because I mean, the the point I understand there's there's a point um, to it, but um, it the it might be overwhelmed by um, by trying to make the greatest uh, greatest use of that park space. Um, but like Harvard Yard, you know, the, the Harvard Yard areas got paved over where everybody walked. If they crisscrossed through the through the area, then uh, that's where a path got created. Um, and maybe that's a justification. I, that's not a deal killer to me. Uh, and, you know, frankly, I think, the, again, the projects evolved to a great extent um, that uh, I think it, it seems like it's more realistic but I will say there's, there's some more specificity that the, the, the peer reviewer has brought up um, that, um, that I think is necessary in terms of um, um, the, the exterior detail and hardscapes. Um, well, Madam Chair, this is- example, Maybe like it, it says generically stone, um, uh, stone veneer for some parts of the outside. Um, it, it would be good to know what kind of stone veneer is that? Is it like, is it glued on fake stone or a real stone? Um, it, it, it probably is important to get to uh, what those exterior materials of the building are you know, you've got carpophenial and those are great in a few places, but, um, and I don't, I, I think I've made enough comment. Uh, those are the main points. I'll, I'll let you move on to the next, next planning board member. So, so let me just ask for the sake of, of uh, operating the meeting the most effective way possible. If we can withhold back and forth, but, but for clarifications, I think we can get through the planning board members relatively quickly and then we can loop back around uh, and, for, and we'll in, introduce the public perspective, but then we can loop back around to the developer, the peer reviewers. I don't know how people feel about that, but, but I feel like it's almost 10 o'clock and if we get through the, at least the initial reactions of the planning board, I think we might be in, in better shape. <clears throat> Madam Chair, this is Adam Brodsky. It's just a process question or a point. Um, which is to Clark's question, the applicant is not looking to close the public hearing tonight and condition the project. However, uh, we've reached the point in the process where we really need a gut check. We really need a sense from the board whether this is a viable project or not in order to make the decision as to what additional resources to bring to bear. So I, I only mention at this point because it might be helpful in the board's comments uh, to give us some sense of what their thinking is. I'm not suggesting that a straw poll is appropriate, but it'd be very helpful to us to know whether or not we're on the right track or the wrong track. Thank you. Thank you. And that's really useful clarification. That'll help us a lot. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. That makes it very clear what you need and it'll give us a target. Um, uh, Tom Callahan. Uh, I'm and, to organize and, my thoughts. Let me three different uh, topics I have inclusionary zoning I you know we did get a letter from the trust I appreciate your efforts um, I would want something more in concrete um, I'm not quite sure George what's constraining you from committing to a project uh, I suppose it's the getting this permit but um, I you know I, I, I'm against having any payment in lieu and so I think we need to craft a condition where something concrete emerges because I don't want to be here a year after we issue the permit and lo and behold, there's no affordable housing created elsewhere in town. I'm perfectly willing to let you create it off site, but um, we need to think about conditioning this in such a way that we still have the ability to impose it on the site um, and I would be perfectly willing to just put it at 87 and not even on the waterfront site. Um, Can I, I make a comment, which is uh, when, we, when we're trying to get through a lot of individuals' comments, if we talk about them in general terms, right. rather than using someone's name, 
because it'll make the person that you're speaking to think they need to respond. So if you right. can say right. it, no, that's fine. Right. So my, my, my general concern is having something in concrete for something offsite. Perfect. Um, the public space, my concern about the public space is an eventual conflict between the public and condominium owners who are going to Tom, we can't hear you. Can you turn off your video? And Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it's terrible, I know. But, okay, so... But continue your comments. You'll have to unmute yourself, Tom. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, Tom. Or is it best that I just shut up? <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you. Just go ahead. Uh, Make your big points. All right. My on the public space, I'm 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 very much concerned about public control of those public spaces, whether it's either deeding it to the town outright or an easement, and Chapter 91 process notwithstanding, I I, I don't want to necessarily rely on that process to protect the public's interest in that space. And I am worried about conflict with the condominium at some point. Uh, so I'd like to create some rules about the use of that space that accommodates both the residents and the public. But it is, you know, control of that space, I think, is very important for the town to have. Um, the last thing is, you know, what you were just, George was just talking about at the end was about the commercial mix and everything. I, I actually think the new design is a step backwards to some extent because I liked having the townhouse look at the street level. Um, and, you know, the waterfront business district does not allow residences. And historically, this site has not had residences for a long, long time, well before the hotel was there. This was a commercial site. And I, I understand what the HVBOD says. I think it's somewhat conflicting. But as far as the spirit of the bylaw, when you, when you the 15% requirement, that's done to maintain a minimum of commercial use when you were taking the first floor for residences. Because normally when you think of mixed use, it's all commercial on the first floor and it's residences above. Well, it's not, you know, what we're having here, I think is almost an all residential project. Uh, I'm not sure what these amenity spaces on this plan here are actually for. Um, you won't see any commercial use at the south building at all from the street side. I just, I'm not <clears throat> saying these are deal breakers, but the intent of the bylaw, as I understood, the overlay was for mixed use, not for majority or sole residential project. And it is, yes, it's bordered by residential areas, but it's never been a residential site for as long as I think you can go back. Um, so I just raised that as a concern. I think the design is a step backwards, frankly. But And then the last thing I'll mention is the height still bothers me. The fact that it's higher than the existing building. It's, you know, again, I've said it before. Everybody's always complained that it's a wall. Well, it's a prettier wall now, but it's still a wall and it's a higher wall. And if there was any way to reduce the height of this structure back to nothing more than what's there today, uh, I would love it. I mean, again, this is not necessarily a deal breaker, but it's still a concern that I have. Thank okay. you, Mr. Callahan. Um, uh, Paul Caleri. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, I, I thought the presentation was informative and I actually liked the redesign. <clears throat> and I think that the applicant um, is providing potentially more commercial space than is required with the um, potential for some summer 
uses of some of the outdoor spaces. Um, I guess in keeping my comment short, I mean, I, you know, I, I share the comments that are in the Q&A with the residents of the town that uh, we're all excited about this project and want to see it be successful for everybody. Um, I guess there's just a couple of things that uh, if I could, I don't know if I, this, but the comments from uh, Weston and Samson, one uh, from, actually, I think a couple of them were from Jim. Um, it talked about raising the hedges a little bit on the south side of the project as you're coming out of the parking area. I think that would actually obstruct the view a bit more. I know that we're trying to work within what the guideline says, but one of my comments from months ago was, I thought that was uh, <clears throat> creating a bit of a blind spot as you look down Border Street, is it? To the left as you're coming out. So, you know, you showed a picture on your slide 27 um, that showed the vegetation. It's kind of low there and you were suggesting it maybe get a little bit higher. I think that might actually be counterproductive to the goal in keeping with safety and, and such. So just one thing for you guys to think about. And then I do also appreciate the idea of putting some benches in some places, but I think one of those proposed areas on the north side of the project um, on that grass area, which is essentially the view corridor that a lot of people were going for, to propose some benches there might actually obstruct some of that view corridor. And that's, that was, I think, all that I had for this evening. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Colleri. Uh, Eric Potter. Uh, so I go to this project a lot of thought. Um, and I think there's a spirit of bylaw versus the spirit of the project. For me, I've, uh, I'm leaning on the side of spirit of the project. I think that we're in a unique position where we have local residential developers um, that live in town that are gonna to be committed to making this a, a, a successful project. That's very unique in a situation like this. And I think there's gotta be some weight placed on that. They also have significant support. All the comments that I see, all the letters that come in, people that talk around that live in that area seem to be in support of this project as well, which I think is very important. We certainly would give that a lot of credence in a large home review. And I, I gotta be honest, I, I like the design. I like the way it looks. I think the view card looks great. I like the new design. Um, I, I'm someone that really relies upon peer review for specifics with regards to working out those, the minutia. Um, I rely on Clark for a lot of the comments and, and Tom and Amy and Paul uh, with regards to that, those sorts of things, you know, as, as long as there's compliance with the zoning and building uh, ADA and, and, and all those uh, bylaws and codes, I, I, I'm, in, I'm in support of the project moving forward. Um, I, I would say that my biggest concerns uh, would be uh, the conditions with the public space, uh, making sure that uh, it remains open to the public. Uh, I do understand that Chapter 91 does govern right now, but it's only a statute. It could be changed moving forward sometime in the future. It could be you know, amended in some way, however unlikely that is. It would be nice to have some sort of concrete um, assurance that that's always going to remain a public space if it can be done. Um, I would like to see, you know, I, I have no problem with the commercial space, the interior commercial space. Uh, square footage wise, I know it doesn't comply with the bylaw, but I do think the outdoor public space is, is what's really needed down in that area anyway. And again, if there was some sort of assurance that there would, from the town, that that could be used for kiosks and there's going to be approvals for seasonal use down there, I think that would go a long way and that'd be a condition that I'd want to see on a, a special permit approval. Uh, and then the other one uh, item that I would want a condition placed upon would be uh, the affordable housing, um, making sure that, like Tom said, that it is addressed and there is a plan moving forward so that it's not something we have to circle back on and, and wonder how it's gonna be accomplished or get done. Um, those will probably be the two conditions that I focus most on um, within a special permit approval is uh, just assurance of that public space use and uh, the affordable housing um, moving forward. But you guys did a great job and uh, it's been very informative throughout the whole process and it's moved along uh, more quickly than I thought when we meet. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, I'll just make a, a few additional comments. 
because I'm going to summarize as best I can what's been discussed. Um, I still, uh, so I, I do think that there has been um, a lot of thoughtful response and deep thinking about how to make something work that will fit in that context and really make it flourish. Um, I think pulling back in the numbers, I, I never even thought about that as a possibility. Um, I think um, uh, I, I had a lot of uh, concerns about the garage. I'm glad to see that there was an alternative uh, potential solution. I'm not as convinced yet about the kind of visual impact of having the parking underneath the structure, but everybody gets used to things as they get access to more information and they think about it. Um, I still have a, some um, sort of logistical issues that I, I don't feel I have heard much about. And I have to tell you, you probably have heard me that this evening, I think a lot about standards and I think a lot about, I think a lot about change. And I can run numbers in my head about what I think is going to happen in that general vicinity. And I don't feel that using standards from a, from a sum of experiences to discuss what the transportation consequences are going to be for the development of this project is sufficient for the tight space that it's going to be occupying. So I still look forward to seeing some further consideration for that. There's a lot of open space that's in that general area and that area is going to grow. Rather than making the decision about, in, in the absence of accepting what is going to change, is to really think about what we as the town, in collaboration with the developer, should be considering when it comes to infrastructure. It's not the developer's responsibility to provide the roads for all the things that are going to happen, but we have to plan for them and that has to be a part of the thinking um, that takes place. I think that there are um, lots of solutions to hardscapes that it's, it's not, I don't expect that it's the moment you're gonna lay them out and, and it's gonna be really clear exactly what we're gonna see. But I do know that um, the aesthetic of what you're building juxtaposed with blacktop is problematic. It's visually problematic and there are other alternatives. And so I'd like to see some design solutions for the, for the feel of the space and, and the suppleness and the softness of the space, which right now it feels like you're putting a really interesting sp building on top of stuff that's gonna be um, really hard. I, I agree with Clark that we don't have a strong sense of the sort of moving of people. And I also think that it's, it's interesting he should think of Harvard Yard because where I work, we have all sorts of paths that people have carved and every time they try to put grass on them, then people rock, walk on them and everything is a mud pile. So I, I think that just thinking a little bit more about, let's, let's assume that the building is built and let's make the public access space the most remarkable space we can possibly imagine. And then think about what does that include? Does that, what kind of vegetation it includes, what kind of objects it includes, what sort of passageways, what sort of gradients and things like that, because that's what the public is going to experience. And we have this uh, totally unique ex opportunity to actually think about it in a way that you don't usually, it's always an afterthought. It's lit, you build the building and that's the big deal. But in fact, the physical setting is what's gonna really matter to the public. Um, I, um, I want to congratulate you for reaching out and talking to the folks in affordable housing. I, I um, appreciate the fact that you have a lot of push and you can actually make something happen that we can't do on our own with the trust as we have it configured right now. It's a baby. It hasn't grown up yet. Um, I, but I, I also have a high bar for that. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing um, alternatives that more than one. I want to see opportunities. I, I like the idea of affordable housing if it's not going to be on site to be in neighborhoods, but I but I want to see that. And I thought it was really cool that you had um, an apartment building, uh, you know, or some some multi units uh, possibility uh, in mind. So uh, uh, you asked. I, I, I'm going to stop now. We'll go to the public comment. We will come back to the planning board, and we will give you a, a sort of you know finger in the air, see which way the wind is going because I, I understand that that's something that's important to you. So um, Jen and uh, Lauren, will you manage that? Or Lauren, would you like to comment first? 
Yes, thank you. Um, first, I just want to thank everybody who's here. I know it's been a long night for everybody. I thank you to the applicant, the consultants, our peer reviewers, everybody on the board, and we still have a lot of members in the public here, um, so I'll keep it brief. I just want, in echoing some of the comments that have been made, I think at this point, after hearing the presentations tonight and the sentiments of the board, that some of the next follow-up steps that I would recommend, um, we've already heard requests for um, documentation, or at least in draft form, for the homeowner Association, as well as for the commercial space, how that would function, the public space, how that would, you know, whether it be a deed to the town or how we would accommodate um, that aspect. I would also suggest that we begin to start thinking about the construction management plans so that we can begin to work on something that would work for public safety, how we'll stage that so we won't be, um, you know, of a huge impediment to that area. Um, as well, I just want to echo that, you know, in the absence of, um, you know, with the change of the garage, I just want to really make sure that there's whatever we can do from an architectural standpoint for a vibrant streetscape, you know, making sure there's doors on the street and things of that nature so that we have some interaction along that corridor. Um, and then again, just really echoing on, on the public space aspect. So with that, I just will turn it over to public comment, but I just wanted to give some food for thought for our next steps as we lead into the next meeting. So what I'm going to do for this, we have six comments. People have given their names and addresses. I'm going to read all these comments in the order they came in, and then I'll turn it back to our chairperson um, to follow up if there's anything that needs further clarification here. And if there's any other attendees in the audience, if you could please input into the question and answer your name and address in your comments. Thank you. So first I'll start. Uh, we have Hugh and Pam Kelly of 15 Border Street. We are butters to the proposed pop property. After reviewing the overall plans along with the most recent modifications, we are in full support of moving forward with this initiative. There are a number of things that we like about the project. One, public park access to the top of the cove, first time in 50 plus years. Two, fantastic view corridor from the village to the harbor for all to enjoy. Three, significant visual improvement and real estate tax revenue for Cohasset. Next, we have Robert Jeffers, 18 Spring Street. I think this was solidly presented and should be approved when the time comes. I love the access to the park by the water. I think residents will love it. A great place for families to go. More access to the water is something I think a lot of Cohasset's residents desire. From an affordable housing perspective, I feel the idea of creating units in town is a great idea and will result into actual units that will benefit people, which is something that the town has not done in a decade. As the chair of the Affordable Housing Committee, I support the letter you received from the Affordable Housing Trust supporting this approach. I have no financial interest in this project. The next comment um, is from Dave and Lisa Fulton of 31 Border Street. As neighbors who have been involved in the harbor planning process and have lived in the harbor area for many years adjacent to a defunct hotel, we support this project and the proponents, who both are neighbors to us all and have a history of creating quality developments. In addition, the public benefits should be given extra weight in your review of the program. We request the planning board moves this project forward as currently designed to final approval. The next comment is from Doug, Doug McGregor of Seven Border Street. As an abutter who has participated in this very open process and on behalf of my 38 neighbors who signed my earlier petition to advance this project, this project has enthusiastic support across town. The project is now scaled back, but just as beautiful, and they kept their promise on the generous public open space, space that should be viewed as a gift to the town. This is the real non-residential use and public accommodation for all citizens, not just for citizens that can afford private retail uses. Open space on our harbor is the ultimate public accommodation and will never fail. There is no need for our enjoyment to be made more commercialized than needed. I feel this project needs to be given concrete indications it will be approved with specific benchmarks they can work with. The next comment from Janet Fogarty of 114 Elm Street. This is such an improvement to the harbor area and allows a walkway connecting the town pier to wrapping around the harbor. It would be disappointing to not see this through after all this. I'm in a butter at 114 Elm Street. And the final comment we have is um, from Glenn and Margaret Holland at 17 Border, I'm sorry, there's two more that came in. This is Glenn and Margaret Holland at 17 Border Street. We're in support of this project as we believe it will be a significant improvement to the harbor and will benefit to the town. And the final comment that just came in, Rick and Jit Shea, 52 Margin Street, we support. Plan is responsive to planning board comments, a welcome upgrade to the present poorly maintained ugly monolith. Attractive design, public space, finally opening this end of the harbor to the public. After a double check, that is all of the comments that we have received. I will turn it back to Madam Chair for further comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I noticed up in the right-hand corner, 
where we have panelists and attendees and we have hands up and there's three people asking for comments. So are those three people, Tim Davis has a question or a comment uh, and, and he hasn't spoken yet. So uh, would you like to give Tim Davis an opportunity to speak? Certainly. Tim, are you there? I'm here, I'm just, am I, can you hear me now? Yes. Am I live? You are. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you all for all your uh, hard work. Let me just say that uh, uh, while I uh, speak as chair of the Harbor Committee, I don't speak for the Harbor Committee. However, for over three years, the Harbor Committee has been working on the uh, Municipal Harbor Plan. And uh, this particular project uh, has been in the forefront of many, many of our discussions I can tell you that uh, with our work with three owners uh, slash developers over those years, uh, uh, I have never heard a single uh, Harbor Committee member speak against this project. Uh, each of the uh, developers and particularly this current group uh, with George and Ted uh, have been very responsive to all of the issues that the Harbor Committee has had, uh, including uh, uh, the biggest ones are public access through the view corridor on Elm Street and the captain's walk uh, in front of the, uh, the building. I can also say that uh, there is a uh, municipal harbor, uh, uh, master plan implementation committee working group, uh, the Elm Street working group that is working with the uh, harbor committee uh, to develop uh, access from the village to the harbor down Elm Street and it would be critical uh, to have this project go forward to make that uh, a reality, to provide much better public access to the harbor for those people who don't have access today. So uh, the Harbor Committee, I think, uh, if I were to take a poll, uh, would be uh, overwhelmingly in support of this project and we would encourage the Planning Board to move forward with alacrity to approve this project. Thank you. I see no other comments that have their hand up. So I want you to know I have uh, 13 pages of notes here. And uh, that means there's no way I can summarize the extensive nature of the discussion. Um, and yet I feel that I'm uh, uh, sort of expected to do something so that we can move this forward. Um, but I'm going to make a quick run through the uh, planning board members and give them each a chance to add whatever final comments they would make. And then I will try to um, make some, you know, 35,000 square, 35,000 uh, foot reflections on what has been discussed today. So Clark Brewer. Sorry, Lauren has a comment. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, I just wanted to notice um, Eve Tapper has her hand up to make a comment. Sorry, thank you. Eve, please. Hi, thank you. Um, I, I was just uh, taking lots of notes as everyone else was, and it, it, it occurs to me that the kinds of um, questions and uh, outstanding issues that the planning board members have are mostly can mostly be covered by uh, conditions, not all, but mostly can. And my suggestion was going to be that um, the planning board maybe take a straw vote tonight or uh, if, if you want. Um, and then we the, as staff, we can write draft conditions uh, based on what we've heard uh, the applicants and the planning board members and their concerns and then bring that back to um, the next board meeting so that there's a little something a little bit tangible uh, because the conditions are uh, are some of them are very specific some of them are very general and in and usually um, the way they're written in a decision is you know before this point in the in the process these things have to be done before this point in the process these things have to be done so they don't all have to be done before they put their first uh, uh, shovel in the ground if in fact the planning board uh, is inclined to approve this. I'm not trying to say that they, 
you don't, you want to uh, approve it or not, and you don't need to make that decision tonight. But if you want the pl the planning staff to um, kind of put down on paper the kinds of conditions that we think are still either unresolved or at least are issues that would like to be addressed, uh, we would be happy to do that. And uh, it's better to do that before you close the public hearing because then you can have some feedback from the applicant as to whether they'll agree to them. Uh, because you don't want to put conditions on that they aren't going to agree to or they might want to change the wording of so that it, it works. We get to the same end, but it looks a little bit different. Uh, therefore, uh, they'll actually get a decision that they can work with and that they can build, which, um, or, or uh, obviously if you are inclined not to approve the project, then you don't need any conditions, you just need findings. But it sounded like there were a number of the board members who were inclined uh, to be interested in the project if certain other conditions were met. And so I was thinking it might be a good place for the staff to start putting those on paper. Um, and then if, Jesus if, if we put it forward um, and there aren't enough or you want to add more, uh, and it's, but it's up to the, it's up to the planning board the, yourself. If the, you still don't have enough information that you feel like you still can't even get to that point, that's okay too. I was just uh, trying to offer our services so that you don't have to keep writing it all down at each meeting. Uh, it's, it's the planning board's discretion. I just wanted to offer that. Uh, thank you for that. Are, are there other staff comments? So, um, what I would say, uh, uh, Tom Callahan, I, I was going to. Well, yeah. No, no, I'm good. I, I, mean, I think that's what Eve's just brought up is an internal discussion, not a public discussion right now of how, how we're going to start drafting conditions about this. All right. Um, uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I think that, by the way, I think the consensus is to approve this. It's just she, she's right. There's certain details, but I think, you know, if the applicant wants some direction, I feel fairly safe in saying that. But I think we're certainly leaning toward approval of this in some form. Lauren? Um, I just wanted to add that I can, I was going to, um, I'm already compiling a document draft for the documents we've received in preparation for some sort of decision. Uh, I can circulate working with Eve and the chairperson on the comments that we've heard tonight and we can have a first draft at conditions to at least review at our next hearing. Of course, uh, we can discuss those in further detail as needed, but I'd be happy to put that together. Uh, thank you for that, because I, um, we had discussed that that's, that would be the step that we would take, which was to first get, um, uh, it's almost like having a checkoff list because we have gone through things to the point where for some, we have a specificity that is operational and some are still not operational. And so we want to be able to se separate those out so that we are able to give a clear signal um, and uh, to, to ensure that every member of the board feels that the deliberation process has uh, gone um, the way that it should in light of the levels of I issues that have been discussed across the meetings we've had. So let me um, continue with my questions back to the planning board members with regard to whether or not they have any additional comments for this evening that they wanna make sure either to underscore or that they wish to add based on what they've heard. Clark Brewer. Well, just uh, I'd like to say, I think the project's going in a, in a positive direction. So I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna, um, I, I don't think a straw poll is a good idea. But, and, and I think um, um, if, if um, a draft of a, a decision with conditions can be put together or started, I think that's uh, useful as well as um, as the as the follow up items that uh, have been addressed uh, to date. Uh, and you know, I, I think there 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 may be it, it may be that we can close the at least close the public hearing um, part of this uh, at our next meeting. That's all I have to say. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be taking a small straw, straw poll as we go. Uh, Tom Callahan? I, I, I have nothing more to add right now. I think I said my piece. So. Okay, so I'm going to take that. Um, Paul Caleri? Could someone define a straw, straw poll to me? <laughs> well, we're not really taking one. I mean, I know, what we're I know. Doing is but, to, but what is it? What is a straw poll? Are you really asking that question? 
It's a fake vote. It's a fake vote. Uh, it's a, it's it would be a non-binding, uh, you know, I, I'm inclined if this or that yeah. were to change. It, it's, not not, it's not binding. It's not a, you know, you're not voting on a particular uh, decision. It's just, it would give the applicants an idea of where you're going. And by just telling them where you think you're going, that's as good. Yeah. But it's not, a, it's not an actual vote. I, I it, it's it. just an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Madam Chair. Um, I, I would say, uh, so Paul, it's your turn to uh, add anything you'd like in, into the comments. I have no further comments excited about the project. All right. Thank you very much. Eric Potter. No further comments. Excited about the project as well. All right. Um, so th let me say that, that what I've heard over the course of the evening is some very significant things have been resolved. Uh, and then the, but my, my, my greatest uh, re reflective commentary is more specificity, more specificity, more specificity. And that doesn't surprise me any because uh, the, a lot of the really big issues, which were, could only emerge as you went through the design and development process, um, had to be thought out. And, and so we have, we have reached past that stage. But where we are now are on the sticking points. And I think that, that we'd be, we would be remiss in not suggesting that those are the issues that matter to people, right? So we've talked about the public space and making sure it's governed. We've talked about certain kinds of uh, material qualities associated with the project. There still are some um, kind of logistical issues that may need to be resolved. Uh, there still is, I think uh, it's going to be brought back up again. And so I think we have to address it, which is what does, what does the commercial look like? You know, that's going to be something that is, in fact, part of the public as well as the private interests. Um, so I, I would say that um, we made really great progress and, and the participants in the, the design experience have um, made a lot of effort, really clear, concise effort for us to follow. Um, so I, my, my view is that um, I would ask, <clears throat> I don't hear any dissents. Um, uh, but I do hear a lot of, of commentary about specificity and that can come first from us compiling what it is that we have been keeping track of, checking it off the list, finding those things that are really important and coming back to a meeting with that as our subject, then thinking that we're going to go through a, a, a long, you know, a very extensive and relatively inexact list of issues. So, um, I think that the public, I think that the board sentiment is um, positive toward the project. And the I would ask that, um, uh, uh, I'm not sure this, this is my first um, uh, turn with uh, dealing with a situation like this, the scale of it and, and its, its magnitude. And so I'm going to ask Eve, what would be a step forward to say that um, there's positive sentiment, but there's no commitment. We can't make a commitment. That's, well, I, I, think mean, it's been, I think that's it's been fairly art articulated fairly well by everybody here tonight. I don't think there's any reason to belabor it anymore. It sounds to me like everyone's in, in, in general favor of the project, which would mean that without having to take any poll that binds you to in any degree, any good degree that we're, you know, for all intents and purposes, moving on to conditions uh, that have to still be ironed out. And, and that's what it comes down to. So I think moving forward, it's, it's about trying to iron out those, those, those conditions and, and maybe getting them on paper so that it's in black and white does uh, help the board out so, it, so that everyone's on the same page on to, as to what the, the language is potentially going to look like, you know, prohibiting any major changes. So I guess I hear it slightly different than that. What I hear is that uh, Eve and, and Lauren uh, should be uh, actively in a position to generate the list of, of issues and make it possible for us to separate what was concerns to what has been resolved uh, and, and that we would then come back together because there still are some pretty significant issues that are not resolved yet that should be specified before we close a public hearing and deliberate. And so I, I my own view is that the, the, we ask staff to come to us in the next meeting 
after we have been given a list of the issues, we check them off and then we come and then we are in a position to make a, an, a, a more uh, a firm decision. There's no, there's no the, the message is a positive message, but there still is a lot of things which could be tidied up more effectively before we, we go further. Yep. Um, Karis Norris. Yeah, Madam Chair, thank you. I, I, I agree with you. I think that you need a combination of uh, sort of a, a checklist of issues that are still open and starting to draft uh, perhaps in more broad language uh, these conditions that may require further tweaking of the project or you know, further documentation or discussion back and forth between the planning board and the applicant. So I, I think that's an iterative process, but I think it's you know, at, at the time to start putting some of these concepts into, uh, into words and language that, that everyone is ultimately gonna have to agree on, but I agree you're not quite there yet. And I'm happy to work with the staff on, on those conditions right. and language. Um, all right, so um, Eve. Sorry, uh, so I had uh, just to add to that. So the, the decision itself will have findings and conditions. We can, uh, at the planning board's dis discretion, we could also start to try to draft the findings which may uh, address some of the things that are still left out or we can just come with a list of conditions to start the discussion and then we can, you know, we can have the board members specifically say what they might fi make for findings at the next meeting and make it a more than two step process. So mm -hmm. whatever the board wants us to start putting in writing. Again, remember, we're just putting it in a draft and the board members can go through it and should go through it line by line and make sure that um, you agree with it. And also, obviously, Karis is here to make sure that it's all legal. Um, mm -hmm. but, but if we put out a draft, it doesn't mean that's what's going to be the decision. It's just a, something to look at so that you can make sure. I, I would also suggest maybe, I know a lot of the board members have been taking their own notes of what's important to them. Um, and mm -hmm. perhaps, in Karis, is this legal? Can they send all of those to, to Lauren, but nobody else on the board? so that we can make sure that we compile them or are they not allowed to send them um, at all for open meeting rules? Individually, they can send them to Lauren and they would be public documents. So, um, but they shouldn't copy anybody else on them. Okay. So yes, they so can do the, that. If the planning board would like to do that, the individual members would like to do that to send it to Lauren and me and to Jen and Karis, um, you, can, you can send them and then uh, we, because some of them might be Similar, some of them honestly may be opposite, and then those are the kinds of things that we would flag and, at the next meeting and say, you can't do both. Well, well, I want to be clear. You have to be careful about what, you know, there can be questions, but they shouldn't be determinations. I want to see X, Y, and Z. I, you have to, I think you have to be careful about um, Right, so they, I'm, how well, that I'm for their draft, yeah. draft conditions. You can write them as draft conditions, yes, and we will put them into um, it, we will put them into the document. I, I think it's more flagging issues to be drafted okay. into conditions. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. I noticed Tom Callahan. Yeah. Can I just? I mean, this goes back to my personal conduct on boards, going back to conservation in the '90s. I feel very, very strongly that on a particularly on a significant project like this. This has to be written by the members of the board with all due respect to staff. Um, I expect staff to contribute and fill in and help us with some of the details of all the things that have been filed, but this really needs to be written by us. Hey, Tom, Tom we, we as board members have never written the decisions. What well, we have yeah, done I, is- Yeah, and, I, and, I, have, and them. I have, and I'm just, it's put my, my own personal preference or inclination because I've done this before and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to well I, I you know I, I don't agree. Agree. Madam Chair can I make a comment wait, wait, wait. This, this, I didn't want to air I didn't want to air our laundry in internal operations to the world here but I just feel very strongly the board needs to drive this decision as opposed to staying of course of course okay 
Okay, so Clark, thank you. Yeah. Um, Eve? I, 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 I agree 100% with Mr. Callahan. The board needs to own this decision. What I'm only suggesting is that we put something in writing that the board can then uh, discuss in detail and we will make every change. But it, someone, and I, I mean, if Mr. Callahan, if you want to take a shot dra at drafting the whole thing, uh, that's fine too. I was just trying to make it easier so that the whole board could go over it. Nothing that I'm writing is, uh, is approved unless you guys go over it for, with, with the fine tooth comb and, and dot every I and cross every T. I was just trying to uh, suggest that we put a draft on the table so that the board can look at it. Sometimes it's easier to see uh, so to to uh, to uh, react to something as a group than it is to actually have five or six people writing at the same time. But if a board member wants to take the lead and write the draft instead of staff, that works for me. I don't, you know, I, I don't need. I just want. I, I was just suggesting that a draft be presented at the next meeting. So, so my view of what our staff is going to do because we've had several hearings several meetings and there are tapes of those meetings and they have detailed information in them that you sort through them and you put them into some kind of order so that they can be harvested as something more than just words, that it can be organized in an effective fashion and we can use that as an input to the, the work that we do in drafting um, a decision. So I, I see there being a process by which staff gives us what it is that has actually transpired in an organized fashion. And then we work with that and with staff to generate um, something that we can work with. We sort out what it is that we are completely uh, in accord with. And then we sift down to the things where we still have uh, need of discussion. So I, I guess I see it as a, a process of, of generating things that you can use usefully use um, as a starting point. I don't know if that's, you know, an irregular way to do it, but I don't know how else you do it when what you have is a bunch of oral testimony in which people have said lots of different things. Uh, Clark Brewer. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion to continue the hearing. Uh, second. Uh, is that Eric Potter second? Eric Potter second. Uh, do we have a date? Do we have a date? And our next meeting. Just our next meeting is the 21st. Our next meeting after that is November 18th. Can we, can we, can we do a meeting on November 11th or 4th just for this? We so cannot we do. I'm sorry. We agreed that we weren't going to hold a meeting on the 4th. And November 11th is Veterans Day. Yeah. But realistically, uh, um, Lauren and, and Eve, when it is all said and done, you've got probably about 70 or 80 pages of transcripts that, you, that, that need to be sorted through so that we can effectively utilize them and check them off and then, then we're done with it. So what, what do you think is the reasonable amount of time it's gonna take? It's not in our box, it's in your box where it has to be dealt with. Right, and my reaction is that next week, um, we already have several things on our agenda that night. And also it's just too short of a turnaround time to get the deliverables that we have discussed tonight. I do recognize that the 18th is um, pretty far out. I mean, that's six Wednesdays from now. So, I mean, I would suggest if the board would be willing, knowing that we, we've met, this will be our, next week will be our third meeting in October. Um, we could either meet on the 28th of October or we could add a meeting on an alternate night of the week in November. I, I look to the board for what you prefer. That's the 28th. 28th of October, yeah, let's, 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 that's two weeks from now. Two weeks is too soon. That's too soon for staff. It's I, too yeah. soon. And we, there's so there's so much work in town right now. It's just it's impossible. Right, but it would give the applicant a chance to respond. Um, We're talking about people having 18-hour day jobs, and and that's not okay. So 
I think as much as I'd like to say yes, I think we have to be thoughtful. Oh, and yeah, sure. We can, we can drag it out. I mean, the 18th. It's not about dragging it out, Clark. It's about trying to be reasonable given the I world. don't mean it in a bad way. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It, yeah, the 18th is fine. So um, at uh, 7 o'clock? It could be at 6.30. We've okay. been starting at 6.30. Motion to continue to the 18th of November at 6.30. So may I ask one question before we, we do this uh, last gesture, which is, Mr. Brodsky, do you feel that you have enough information based on the discussion that we've just gone through to suggest that we are, um, we've given you the, 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 the wind is in the, in the right direction? Do you feel that way? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We're, we are very encouraged and look forward to working with the board to complete this process we're going to use this time to try and tie up all of the loose ends because we've all been keeping notes, uh, but we would encourage the board, given the timing, uh, to have conditions. Uh, so at least we have a framework for discussion, and we'd ask that those please be shared with us if appropriate so that we, we can weigh in on them so that when we meet again on the 18th, it can be a very productive conversation. So we'll, we'll be extremely mindful of what you've requested. We're going to deal with the logistics of the moment, but we hear what you're saying. And I hope that uh, you feel that we're um, being straight up. Oh, no, absolutely. But uh, it's often helpful to have the applicant involved when you're discussing conditions prior to the board closing a hearing and voting uh, to make sure that we've ironed out as many details as possible. Right. So as soon as we can, we, we will be in touch with you and we're going to be working with you closely. Thank you very in much. In the context of information exchange, not decision making. Uh, under, understood. Okay. And Is we're very okay? grateful. Just so, just so I know, Amy, because November 8th, so there's no opportunity, at law, and maybe this is for Lauren and Eve and, and Jen. There's nothing the first couple of weeks. We, we're, we're, are we booked up then? I, 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 forgive me. I don't. Have my yeah, we, we are booked up and um, it, it's just, it's really, really hard right now. There's so much going on. Okay, it's understood. I get it. So thank you for your, thank you for understanding. All right, Clark, would you please uh, start over again and let's see if we can get this room empty. Um, motion to continue the hearing to the 18th of November at 630. May I get a second? Second. second. Eric Potter. <laughs> I did it back. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Sorry, um, Tom Callahan. Yeah, yeah, aye. Clark Brewer. Aye. Paul Kaliri. Aye. Amy Glassmeyer. Aye. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Here. Do you have any other business, or can we do a motion to adjourn? I think we did not schedule any business after this because we knew this was going to be a long evening. No, I mean, is there meeting minutes and stuff like that? N not that I actually I do have minutes written. I'm very excited to say, but I haven't sent them to you. So we're okay. going to be getting, all right. <laughs> uh, I, I don't motion to adjourn. I don't think there's any business that we didn't know about. <laughs>